welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased to uh, have folks joining us for our commemoration event. We're just going to give you a moment to have a to go get yourself a cup of tea, get yourself settled in, and we will be short, starting very shortly. And I'll hand off to Raoul Curtis Machen at that point. But please get yourself ready for what is looking to be a really interesting morning of talks. Well, welcome everybody to Culloden, a place worth protecting, our online event to mark the 275th anniversary of the Battle of Culloden. Thank you all for joining us. We had started planning this event well in advance, and of course with the tragic events um, with the Duke of Edinburgh last week, it's meant that it was a, a, a too complicated job for us to actually cancel and try and shift this event, so we've rejigged the content so we will finish in plenty of time uh, to mark the sad funeral. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. We have basically a game of two very exciting halves uh, this morning which takes us through some of the most exciting research that we are starting to uncover about the battle from the interpretation of our of the LIDAR data uh, and Derek Alexander will present on that. And we also have Professor Christopher Duffy's latest map research and account research looking at the battle and the various troop movements and actions during the battle. This is of vital importance to us at Culloden. Um, I should have said earlier, sorry, I'm just the operations manager. I'm not expert on Culloden. Um, it's, it's, it's my job to keep everything running here. Um, but we absolutely rely 100% on the latest research and the latest analysis to help us inform the public about the Battle of Culloden and to a certain extent to, to, to bust the myths um, and to try our best to be accurate when we can. Um, I know we do make mistakes from time to time, but research like this gives us the best possible opportunity to actually set the record straight on Culloden um, and tell a broader audience about, the, about what happened here on this day. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Professor Christopher Duffy. Uh, Christopher read history at Balliol College, Oxford. Then he lectured in war studies at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, uh, the British equivalent of West Point in the States, um, while always maintaining private interests in 18th century warfare. Christopher retired on hitting the age bar in 1996, and he has had a very strong and well-loved connection from our side with the National Trust for Scotland at Culloden since 1998. Uh, he's a great supporter of all the things we're trying to do here, and we owe him a, a, a massive debt of gratitude. Um, he joined the English Court Witness Service as a volunteer in 2002, working at a national high security court from 2014. Forensic evidence has had a major effect on his methods of research, and we will learn more about that approach and where it's got us to, in our understanding of the battle. So over to you, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Raoul. Um, the, I'll, I'll face you with some very unpalatable truths. I'm not going to beat about the bush. The, I'll face in the nearest future with the loss of the whole of the battlefield, which lies outside the keeping of the National Trust for Scotland. Uh, the pace of Development is unrelenting, and response has not been tremendously effective. I'm afraid I've lost my vision at the present time. Could I have the app on the screen? There we are. Thank you very much. Um, Clodden and physical microhistory 
what there is to defend, what there is to acquire. And a little note on the back, on the bottom, contact Christopher Duffy, 1757 at gmail.com for historically based assessment of the impact of threatened development on any point of the battlefield of, of Columbia. Now, this idea, a good idea or a bad idea, occurred to me in a germ form about three years ago. I thought there should be a single accessible point of reference which anybody could go to to get an instant read back on threat of development at any particular point of Culloden. Presented to, the, to them in a form which, if they desired, they could put before the Culloden South Planning Committee of the Highland Council in the due form. I'll give them guidance on this. Because at the moment, the only thing which counts in the so called planning system. In fact, uh, planning anarchy is objections entered in, two for, in due form against any specific development with the Inverness South Planning Committee of the Highland Council. This is the only thing which counts. Even this cannot stand necessarily because even if the Highland Council decides against any particular development, the case will be carried by a developer to the Department of Planning and Environmental Affairs of the Scottish Government. And this DPEA, in its wisdom, will appoint an adjudicator, a reporter, to make a legally binding adjudication. This reporter will be a civil engineer or surveyor whose knowledge of the battle can be written on an airline board boarding card and still leave plenty of space. Uh, we have the infamous example of what happened at Plum. Uh, in that case, the reporter was a civil engineer whose background was in waste industrial disposal. In effect, you can say, Culloden was treated as a waste disposal site. Uh, uncannily, one of the word program processors ren renders Dramasi as dump site. And unless you watch out for that, when you're typing out what your printer actually works, you can send things off, say, to the uh, Dumbassi War Hotel, uh, labelled Dump Site Hotel. Not a good thing to do. Um, this notion stayed with me. I regretted very much from the start taking it on because I hadn't realised what it actually implied. Far more work than I'd envisaged. If I'd known what it was involved, I would have walked away uh, uh, immediately. Most disturbing, it involved me very soon in something I didn't want to do, which to actually reassess the course of the battle, which is very far from my intention. Could I have the next one, please? Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, let's have a look at this slide, which I hope is clear on your screen. Uh, we have a data for the Ordnance Survey, uh, the battlefield as it stands today. Um, best way to start is driving up the B9006 from the west or the left on your screen. Uh, ground gradually ascends, describes a curve, which is the deviation of the road carried out in the 1980s to carry it north of the supposed northern visit of the battlefield. And then it, it actually resumes its original course. And this road corresponds with the original Moore Road of 1746. In the middle, we have the property in the keeping of the National Trust, outlined in green, with various key points. And uh, this, as you can see, covers only really a, a relatively small area of the whole battle area, which you can pretty well define as the whole area on, on this particular screen. We have familiar points, the visitor center, the car park, the inner cottage, well in the dead, and so on. To the modern job. Um, the problem is development, obviously, and I've entered in red some of the more obvious intrusions. At the top, we have the infamous View Hill, which the authorities assured us in their wisdom when they granted this permission will be invisible from 
the visitor center, where we know they're coming. Not only is it visible from the visitor center, it is visible from the far side of the River Nair, which you can see on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So much for the authority. I'd ask you to look in particular at the left center of the map and agricultural development we have here, which is, can be even more damaging than outright uh, construction of a housing estate. We have a very intrusive new barn set up and a new agricultural road, which turns roughly south-southwest, west-southwest, and executes a cute left-hand turn to the neighborhood of the present King's Stables. I would, I'll ask you to remember this road and you see how it continues on. And this road is going to be very important indeed from the aspect of conservation. Now, I'd assumed when I started this work that there would be plenty of actual information available. In fact, the information available on Culloden in original sources and second, secondary literature is unequaled in Euro European history until we come to the Battle of Waterloo or the American Civil War. Tiny battle, but massive in, in terms of actual documentation and secondary description. The trouble is there's very little specific detail in it. We can go back to the original sources. The only specific features ever mentioned by anybody, apart from the general bogginess, are the two sets of walled enclosures. And I, that was, I was completely stuck within a couple of weeks of undertaking my work. I then went to the last resource, which was maps. So I think here I'm going to agree with Derek. There are probably, are almost certainly, maps at the time, our greatest single source of, source, of, source of information. And I'm going to start with the most important map of the war, of the, of the, the war. So next slide, please. This is the Ordnance survey, first of the kind, ever anywhere in Britain, carried out under the supervision of the Board of Ordnance's chief draftsman, civilian, William Roy, at the express commander of the Duke of Cumberland. Between 1747 and 1755, the express intent purpose of preventing the army getting lost in Scotland, which had done in many times before. General impression, I think there's very little there. Very few landmarks. The only really salient ones are the ones associated with Culloden House and it, its walled enclosures, uh, Culloden Park's enclosure. And can you see the jut jutting out part at the, towards the top of the estate? And something which looks like a letter the number three written in red. Well, that's Culloden House. And that actually stuck out from the Eastern London Park's wall. Uh, this has all, as far as we know, completely vanished from the landscape today, but attempts to reconstitute it are extremely important. I just asked you to look a little bit at a little road, which is a stretch of the wall road, looking past the uh, southern edge of the, of the London Park's wall. But for William Roy, the main road at this period is something which is almost completely vanished now. Would you look at the bottom left-hand corner of the map, and we hear in double parallel lines a road, road up to the commanding height of Belvrade, then gently downhill, curving gently to the right, and on past the little Lenach cottage, little Lenach uh, clump of houses, and on getting merging the landscape, disappearing beyond there called Lena. And this for William Roy was the principal road of the period. And that was going to have a significant effect on the battle, an effect which has so far not actually been picked up uh, by, by the historians. Um, we have the light classically, even in those days, falling from the northwest. And you can see the, the ground falls away quite steeply towards the bottom right-hand corner of the map towards the valley of the, of the, of the river Nair, more gently towards the north. But the most important feature of the whole map 
is the area of bog. This kind of looking like a dismembered octopus to the bottom right, to the centre right of the map. This is probably the original Quill Lodair yellow bog of the lobby. And that was going to exercise a major effect on the, the form the battle actually, actually, actually took. Now, the Royal map is the only one with the scale, one to 36,000. All the other maps we're going to be looking at have little or no indication of scale. But this, I found a very simple way within one minute of identifying what the scale was in units of 800 meters. Then there's the business of magnetic declination, adjusting map north to grid north. And the magnetic declination in this part of Scotland in 1746 was 18.3 degrees west of grid north. So once you've got the scale, that's fine. And then you pivot the map, any map to the right, 18.3 degrees, and you get coherence with, with present wind more. The next one, please. Now, this is interpreting what we've seen in terms of the ups and downs and, and, and the road systems. Now, towards the left, the top left, the Carlton Park's wall, the Moor Road, the present B now in 1006, running close under it, and then continuing on towards the region of Little Leonach. At Little Leonach, it's joined by the, what I call the Ridge Road, one, the one we saw on William Roy Rack, that map coming up from the southwest, running through the Leonach, and the Leonach enclosure, very important point, and merging with the Moor Road, just short of Little Leonach. And here we have the bog transferred to this map. And one branch of the bog actually reaches into the truss proper. And you see it there, it's very close to the uh, bit where it rises in the can, enters the, the bog, body, boggy hollow by the uh, well of the dead. And at that time continued as a feeder of the, of the great bog. This little stream has now been diverted to the north but by a cult. But originally it ran to the left. Uh, looking at a light at a looking at the recent LIDAR um, photograph which, which Derek showed yesterday, and comparing it this with, with Google Map, there's I think something of a hint of change of vegetation, which you can even trace at the present time, corresponding with this particular branch of, of the map. Uh, next one, please. Here we start with a completely stupid map, uh, but a very important one. It was scribbled by Colonel Joseph York, one of the aides de of the Duke of Cumberland, probably within hours of the battle. And this reflects what is important to him and probably also to Clutton about their impressions of the battle before they engaged in any kind of bogging, any fancy cartography. We have the Look the, to the north, we see the Culloden Parks and the Moor Road scutting, uh, scout, just almost touching the southeastern salient. It inclines north and follows, scholar, skirts the line of bogs, which here look like strings of sausages. They are, in fact, William Roy's bogs, as he showed in much more detail of the, uh, in the map we just seen. He has the Jacobite army on the left, forming up in advance of the uh, Carlton Park Wall and the Hanoverian party on the right. Uh, next map, please. Uh, looking at a more sensible map, we, we have the one by uh, John Finlayson, who was the part of the artillery of the Jacobites in, in the battle. And he was the his map, we don't know when it was completed, but probably by about 1751. He was very soon amnestied after the, after, after the rising. He was a, described as an instrument maker, mathematical instrument maker of, of, uh, of Edinburgh. 
And he was the one person with an opportunity to revisit the site after the battle. She almost certainly, almost certainly did. And we have here what looks like a rather confusing set of blobs, but he provided a very detailed key, which is just off this picture here, which uh, enables us to identify exactly what they were. And this is actually very, very important for, for purposes of, of our work. Just want to check one or two details of this. Now, we have a, a matching map by the cartographer of the Duke of Cumberland, uh, Thomas Sandby, his, his cartographer and artist. And his map, together with that of Finlayson, was the best detail we have for the course and alignment and positions of, 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 the, of the armies. Now, I haven't, wasn't not able to show, show the map by Thomas Sandby because my one available copy was rather muzzy. But Derek will be showing you a much better uh, print of it uh, when, when he starts his talk. Uh, next one, please. Now, this map was completed uh, about two and a half or three, three weeks ago. I had been waiting in vain for news of historic environment Scotland, progress with its work on identifying the Clodden Park's wall. And I had to go to Broke and what, what I thought was the best information. Now, just orientation, we have the Clodden Park's wall on the left, the Corwiniac enclosure, its double wall there on the right, and the angular Leonac enclosure just standing off. Uh, the, the usual bog there, and we have the forming up position of the Jagdite army. Now, this is something I have not been able to identify how exactly, what exactly the extent of the army was at this stage. My aim had been for useful purposes to place actions and event and geography to within a maximum of 10 of 100 meters. That was my aim to be of any use. I wasn't able to do it at this on, for, the, for the forming up position simply because the, the maps and comments are so contradictory. Then we find the Jacobite army emerging into the open and extending to the left. Again, a lot more work actually needs to be done on the actual composition of these so called clan regiments in particular. Because though they, they bear the name of particular clan, in fact, a very, very of a very mixed population, uh, as uh, has, has been identified by recent research by, by Dr. Darren Lane of Oregon. Now, in all this, I was just going to touch very briefly on areas of particular interest and reassessment. And I'll leave at the moment the army is there and turn to what Cumberland had in mind. First of all, he found it very, very difficult to approach the battlefield because the way was obstructed by the great bog. And he had to cram his armies into a single massive column and approach the battlefield from the northeast. Eventually, his right-hand column, emerging into the present National Trust property, found what was commonly described as discontinuous in the bog. And this enabled him to deploy into two main lines of battle and a reserve. Prince Charles wanted Lord George Murray to launch the army in an attack at this stage, but Lord George said no. French officer with Prince Charles said, sir, we are finished. I think he probably used more earthier term at, at that time. Now, I'm just going to highlight the main areas of risk testing. Now, as you all probably know, Cumberland detached a pretty big command of two regiments of dragoons with supporting Campbell infantry to execute a major flanking move around the south of the Jacobite position to emerge from the south and hit the Jacobite army in, in the rear. Now, I'm convinced here that the evidence of the map and the documentation speaks with bon voice. I placed the scene of this engagement very close to the Kavunia uh, Park wall, converging on uh, the farmstead of 
of Kochenech. Now, the man in local command of this move was Major General Brand, who had just written the army's full rule book. But in December, he ran, ran into a massive cloud and amb Jacobite ambush of pursuing the Jacobites to Carlisle, and he was ultra cautious. The Jacobites, probably at the initiative of, of Lord George Murray, responded very quickly. Uh, the Jacobite High Command switched to high quality units, uh, Elko's uh, Troop of Lifeguards and the squadron of the elite uh, Franco Irish Fritz James uh, Curacia, heavy cavalry. Now, the interesting thing about this in geography terms is the way the ground falls away in broad steps or, or, or terraces. And here, the intervention of a, a view shed uh, analysis will lend us great in, in precise detail as to when each party came within view of the other. And it wasn't until the English dragoons approached near the top of the slope, they could actually, for a moment, they could see the ground in front of them was bare, because the main Jacobite army was already advancing towards, towards the Hanoverian army. But it wasn't a bare and empty for long. As we've seen, the elite Jacobite cavalry was attached south to confront them on the far side of a little street. At the same time, the Hanoverian cavalry came under fire from the right flank from two good Lonan battalions, which the Jacobites had stationed immediately under the park wall. Now, if you look very carefully, the second Hanoverian line, you can see the right hand troop of Kerr's cavalry executing a quarter wheel to the left. This is because it came under flanking fire from Stonywood's battalion of uh, this uh, rather good uh, Lonan infantry. Now, this Troop didn't suffer heavy casualties, only three killed, but a massive number of horses brought down, which cost it, cost it up to 40% of its strength. And upon this, the Hanoverian cavalry retreats south out of sight. And few shared analysis will show us exactly where it did actually venture out of sight. Now let's carry on to the main battle. Uh, the, the Jacobite army advances and it speeds in its advance by the, by the ridge road running actually through the Lennox enclosure, with results we see here uh, hitting at full velocity the regiment of Barrel and bending back that of uh, Monroe. And the Jacobite forces engaged were the uh, Athol Brigade and the uh, first class regiment of the Camerons. But looking very, drawing very closely together, uh, the, the maps of Thinlison and Sandby, we can restrict almost to the metre what happened all the way along the rest of the line. Uh, the Finnison uh, breaks down the Jacobite forces into five columns. In fact, there are probably more in a wedge shape. And as you can see, one and two are in hand-to-hand -hand contact with the enemy. Three and four, at greater distance, are still within musket range of the enemy, which came to that time 1500 meters. Column number five can be identified with, with the, um, uh, the, um, the Lowland regiments of Perth and, 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 and Graham Bucket and the clan Donald, who vanished themselves to be the elite of the Highland Army. They're out of musketry fire range of, of the uh, enemy, but well within artillery range. Now, sort of misunderstanding now happened. We don't know exactly why the Jacobites extended their army to the left. They've been to keep contact, establish contact with the fog, we don't know. But Cumberland completely misinterpreted this. Now, the unit on the right hand flank of the first line, post of on, when the Jacobites first advanced, was occupied by the regiments of the Royal Scots. Now, Cumberland had received multiple warnings that these men were not to be trusted, because on their way from Ireland and other way to the North Wing, and they had repeatedly declared en masse they were not going to fight the fellow Scots. So Cumberland 
doctors are in by reliable troops, the regiment of Courtney, he brings up on the Royal Scots, right? Brings up the regiment of Battero are immediately behind the Royal Scots, and he switches his cavalry to, the, to extend his line to the far left. So the Royal Scots, whatever their private inclinations, had no, uh, in, uh, no uh, possibility of actually downing tools, as it were, when their friends among the high, from the Highlands were advancing against them. Now, Cumberland and Prince Charles at this point consider that the, the crucial point of this battle was not the scrum around uh, the Renner cottage, but up here in the north. The clan Donald had been raring to attack. They did, in fact, in fact, try and carry out a number of probing, probing attacks uh, in an attempt to goad the Redcoats into a, falling into a panic. But the Redcoats are now so strong that there's no possibility of breaking through. Uh, they, the clan Donald didn't like the look of the way the cavalry is forming out on their far left. And they had a look to their right, they found the whole of the rest of their uh, Jacobin army was in retreat. Now, Finison shows in the center of the map these hollow blue oblongs. And that from him was the way the, the initial stage of the retreat of the Jacobites. Now, I find that difficult to believe because I can't imagine how the Clan Donald would go south rather than, uh, uh, rather than go south, southwest. Now, disaster was threatened. Total disaster. We know heavy casualties incurred by the Jacobites in the retreat by pursuing uh, Annabelle and Cavalry, which has been discussed so well by, by Murray Pitter. But this was short of a complete wipeout. And the Clan Donald, the largest part of it, was able to break three and reassemble in the area of the old Castle Hill south of Inverness. Why was this? This is another passage which demands a re-evaluation. One of the reasons was the presence of an elite uh, small battalion of Irish infantry from the French service. If you look, can you see the southeastern angle of the Cloudon Park Wall? Just look about a centimeter to the uh, east northeast, and you find this little Irish battalion. And by an act of self-sacrifice, it delayed considerable cost to itself, the, 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 the advancing uh, Hanover, particularly dangerous to them with the advancing cavalry. But it wasn't the whole story. And here we return after a long time to the southeast angle of the Culloden Park Wall. Uh, could I have the uh, uh, next one? Now, we're going to look in detail at the uh, Loudon Park Wall from two perspectives. One from an officer of the uh, Hanoverian engineers, Daniel Patterson, our Royal Engineers. And he shows that a cannon opening fire from this angle of the, uh, of the wall against the uh, Cobham's dragoons. Now, the location of this wall, I've had trouble with. I found, so I've been waiting until three weeks ago on news of any progress of uh, historic environment Scotland's archeological research into the wall. Uh, they could give me no idea. When I first asked them a couple of years ago when the work would be ready, they were obviously were not in a state to do so. I had hoped they would give me notice of their of, of when the work would be completed, but they're still working on it. And work like this, when your study is going to have a form of an official document, cannot be hurried. So I don't I got no criticism on, on that. So I had to go by what seemed to me the unanimous verdict of the maps, which is to place it just north of the uh, Parks Wall, in the immediate vicinity of the present King's Stables. I should have mentioned when I showed William Roy's map that the King's Stables didn't exist there, it was just there over the countryside. Now let's look at this map in detail. Patterson, from, as viewpoint of the engineer, shows it to be a very 
carefully prepared full fortification. Stones piled up on the outside, uh, covering gaps which the French, uh, French Count's detachment had knocked in the wall. One uh, breach uh, just to the uh, east, just to the north of the actual salient, one in the actual salient corner of the map of the wall itself, and a third facing uh, to, to the southeast. Now this in particular was a properly formed embrasure with protective banks splaying out on either side. So a formidable, um, formidable uh, earth, a piece of field fortification. And Patterson had the gun here. One of the guns, only had a single gun, but it switched between embrasures. He has it opening the fire at a range of 600 meters against uh, the Jobman's dragoons. Now let's look at a, a companion map by Jasper Lee Jones, the Royal Artillery. And he shows the Hanoverian response, which is absolutely massive. Thumbnail brings up roughly half its available, its available artillery, very roughly, four cannon and uh, three two horn mortars. Now these were light portable mortars, but very devastating effect in their effect. And they had this really murderous task of wiping out this French gun detachment and their solitary gun at very close range. Here's thinking about something like 150 meters. So cannon shot concentrated against this southeast facing embrasure, uh, three pounder cannon shot, and three Kuhu mortars uh, firing at high angle so that their mortar bombs would descend inside the enclosure and, and, and explode. We don't know what happened to this ground attachment or its gun, probably wiped out, but this had a major deterrent effect on the Hanoverian pursuit. Now, the next one, please. Now, here we have a uh, a, a, a chart of, of the hand, of the gun of this of the of this type, a new type of light artillery introduced by Marshal de Saxe. Uh, this this plan actually shows it without its wheels. It's quite a very neat piece of, of uh, gun design and very compact, a really quite small piece, but firing uh, a cannonball weighing four and a quarter inch pounds with a great accuracy. So formidable piece of artillery. I'll conclude with the last slide now, please. Um, here, here, here we have um, Thomas Sandries and his goal and his role of artist depicting this angle of the wall. The troops you see here, the Jacobite army in their original forming art position. Now this is a very neat uh, drawing he has. It shows one breach in the uh, in the eastern side of the wall, though very difficult to see on this picture, he actually depicts this light French cannon, a very small piece actually. But when he drew his pictures, um, Sanby used a lot of artistic impression. And it wasn't artistic to show all the breaches in the wall. Then you have imaginary mountains in the background of the steep. So this is a very tidied up picture of what at the time of the battle must have seemed like a corner of Stalingrad. The three breaches in the walls littered about spent uh, cannonballs, splinters and mortar bombs and fragments of human uh, anatomy. And Duke Cumberland knew about scenes of this kind and he, he once wrote with very considerable perception if people, he said, military art is wrong. Military art, is, military art is wrong because it gives no idea what you could actually see on a battle. If people ever knew what a battle looked like, nations would never ever go to war again. And there I'll sign off. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. That was fascinating. And I, uh, 
I completely see where, where, where the forensic skills now come in. Um, it's a never ending piece of work to try and understand more and more about this battle. So thank you so much. There'll be a chance, uh, chance for everybody to, to give questions um, and we'll hopefully uh, cover some of those in the panel session uh, at the end of the, the, the next bit. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Derek Alexander. Oh. Hello. Sorry, uh, I just was on, on video there. I'm hoping you heard what I said. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I'm going to introduce Derek Alexander, who is the um, Head of Archaeology at National Trust for Scotland. Derek studied prehistoric archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. He specialised in the later prehistory of temperate Europe. He graduated in 1990, worked for the university's commercial archaeology unit for 10 years. Uh, he joined the, the Trust in 2000 as the West Regional Archaeologist and was appointed Head of Archaeology in 2011. Uh, recent research has had a major focus on the archaeology of Jacobite Scotland with fieldwork in Glencoe and Glenshiel. Over to you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raoul. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just share my screen if I can do that. Share uh, from beginning. Okay, can you see all that? Give me a give me a, th a thumbs up. Um, Excellent. What I'm going to do this morning is uh, is a great. I think it's an add-on to what Christopher has already outlined. Um, it's it's great to follow him because he has provided a, a wonderful overview of the military history of the Battle of Culloden, and it's something I I I'm, I wouldn't attempt to do. Uh, I'm an archaeologist. Uh, I, my thing is, uh, is I'm a, a landscape detective, uh, a landscape curator. So. I'm looking for changes in, in, in landscapes. Uh, and from a conservation point of view, that's uh, very important because uh, if you want to protect the significant items in the landscape, you need to know what they are and what the significance is and whether you've, what has come before as well as what you want to pass on to the future. This uh, first slide is um, Culloden Battlefield uh, from the, the line of the old road as it passed through the battlefield heading towards the commemorative cairn. Now you can just make the, out the flags at that time of the Jacobite line. Uh, and for me here, there's a, there's a nice sign uh, in the foreground tells you it's a battlefield. So we know that bit's protected, but it's obviously a lot bigger than that, as we'll see. Uh, I have to say at the outset, I'm. Uh, this is a, a very much um, a synthetic work. It's pulling on lots and lots of different research. Uh, Raoul has already mentioned the importance of research and as a conservation organization, again, knowing what is there and the significance of it is key to protection uh, and to promotion and to providing people's opportunity to experience that on the ground. So it's built, we, we rely heavily on lots and lots of researchers. And I've, I've just drawn your attention to some of the most recent work. And from an archaeological point of view, uh, Tony Pollard's edited book on Culloden, the archaeology and history of the last clan battle uh, is fantastic, uh, pulling together of the archaeological material. And of course, Christopher, who's just spoken and very eloquently previous to me, uh, his wonderful book on the entire campaign of the 45 uh, fight for the throne. I recommend to you. There's thousands and lots and lots of different uh, uh, publications out there for you for you to have have a look at. But I, I, as I go through, I'll try and uh, acknowledge the people who have input research uh, as we go. And there's a thanks at the end as well for that because I, I am heavily drawing on other people's work, and that's very much the nature uh, of, um, of what we do in the trust. Um, Christopher has already uh, um, suggested that you know the, the key to understanding uh, uh, the battle is uh, is of course the, the map evidence combined with the documentary uh, and historic uh, uh, resources and, uh, that tell us about the, the the actual events that happened and of course they all vary uh, peoples the people who were involved on the ground on the Jacobite side and on the government uh, British Army side. Uh, all had different viewpoints, uh, and they, some of them recorded them, not all of them were recorded. If they were all recorded, there'd be about 12,000 different accounts of the battle. There isn't that. But, uh, so we have to work with the documentary side and with the map evidence to try and come up 
uh, with a, as good an interpretation uh, as we can. And of course, th there's lots of disagreements and there's from the map evidence and the documentary sources, as Christopher has already pointed out, they don't always match up. But that's one of the exciting things about history and archaeology in Scotland and in fact across, across the world. This is Sand Bay's map, um, where, uh, which shows quite nicely the arrangement of troops. I've rotated it so north is approximately to the top of the screen here. Um, it's not quite, it's off to the right. Um, the, what it shows nicely is the, is the arrangement of the, as the, both armies are, are lining up. Um, but what I've marked there in blue, the two points in blue, are the key points on the Colwiniac enclosure on the bottom left uh, and the Culloden parks at the top right, which effectively mark the, uh, the lining up of on, uh, uh, at the start of the battle of the Jacobite front line. The red dot at the back is what we often use to position the, uh, the government army, uh, and that's old Leonich Cottage. Uh, but there's lots of different interpretations as Christopher has, has uh, drawn our attention to. Uh, and um, some recent work, as Christopher mentioned, of, by uh, Kevin Munro at Historic Environment Scotland, he presented it at, at a, a, a seminar we had a few years ago at Culloden, was to try and identify the location using map-based evidence of the Culloden Parks uh, corner and where it is. And when you look at all the historic maps, and there are about 30 or 40 of them, different ones, these are photocopies and sketches of some of them just laid out on my flat floor. Um, and most of them are aligned with the north uh, to the, the top of the screen here. You can see the, the blue dots of the Culloden Parks in the top left and the um, Colwiniac enclosures uh, below it mark the line uh, consistently, just about anyway, of the uh, lining up of the Jacobite uh, front line. So locating those on the ground is key. Of course, the Trust a few years ago uh, located the Colwiniac enclosures and reconstructed the, the, the northeast or the northern corner of it. Uh, and uh, it was marked and in, in the, the boundary of the parishes, the local parish boundaries, it was preserved in, in that side of things. Um, there are lots of different maps, and as I say, they don't all agree, uh, and they don't all translate in terms of once you start um, um, trying to overlay them onto the current maps. There's a great deal of variety in terms of scale. Uh, here's a really good one from that shows the Culloden House and, and quite a strange enclosure at the, at the top left there from a French officer. Uh, and some of them, you know, they, they, don't, they, they match better with the current uh, uh, Ordnance Survey uh, than others. But again, it's drawing down to the precise locations and Christopher's uh, maps that he showed previously are, are a wonderful um, uh, attempt to, to summarize many of these different maps. And he's looked at it from a very forensic point of view, which is great. Of course, our understanding of the, of the battlefield is, is, is important from our point of view, from the trust and from an archeological point of view uh, to look at it since the battle. And, and its role in the commemoration of the battle. So Dromossi Moor since 1746, there's a great chapter by uh, Elizabeth Mason and Jill Harden in Pollard's book. Um, obviously, in, this is the Ordnance Survey map, and it's, this is published in 1903, but it marks the clan graves quite clearly, um, each with them, their names attached. Doesn't show very well there, but when you color them in, all the red marks the graves and the ones that you saw often get forgotten are the ones along uh, the, the Campbell ones further to the south uh, southwest, and this the location of the commemorative cairn and the line of the road that is not through in the 1830s uh, from uh, Inverness uh, uh, to the northeast, and it cuts through right through the the, the clan graveyard, uh, and bones were exposed at that time, and of course you can also see off to the right old Leon Cottage, which marked the just behind. Uh, the government uh, uh, front line. Yeah, so the, the cairn and the uh, graves and the gravestones were added uh, by Forbes of Culloden uh, in the 1880s, so it's quite late, but it's a commemorative marking of the spot, and the cairn itself is constructed, although foundations were earlier, uh, the, the, the cairn as we see it today was constructed in the 1880s. I don't know if you saw Darren Lane's talk this morning, which is fantastic. Um, and the, there is something special about Culloden. 
and people visited it quite quickly, certainly in the 19th century. And here's a lovely photograph of the late 19th century showing the cairn uh, and the road that was knocked through the graveyard um, and continued to be in use until the eight, uh, 1980s. Uh, and on the right hand side, you maybe just make it beyond these figures in the middle of the road, some of the gravestones there. So uh, understanding how things have changed and what, uh, what uh, is protected is key for a conservation organization. Uh, this is, uh, I'll come back to the background map, which is our LIDAR survey of it. But this is a, a summary of the, uh, uh, the trust's ownership. Uh, in the center here is the old road. Uh, and in the middle, the bits that came into our ownership, first of all, uh, the uh, ground around Old Leonich and then the cottage itself, the commemorative cairn and the clan graves, and uh, Christopher mentioned King Stables uh, out to uh, the west there, close to where the Jacobite left wing was anchored. Um, in 1945, Cumberland Stone uh, and the little patch of ground there came into our uh, care uh, and then uh, in 1981 the conifer plantations were given to us from the forestry commission and here you can see the surrounding uh, mature conifer plantation that had been removed uh, by the 1980s but you can see how how it hid a good chunk of the battlefield and the views from the commemorative cairn were incredibly restricted finally uh, or not finally because we there's other bits that have been added, but probably a big chunk of, uh, of important ground was the field of the English, the open area of agricultural land, uh, which lies to the southwest of the current visitor center. So that's a piecemeal uh, expansion of our, uh, our land holding over time. And of course, with that um, has come an understanding of how, how we can manage it to open up views. Uh, and we also get an idea of how tourists um, uh, change their visits to the sites um, and what the focus of uh, visitor uh, uh, concentration was. Of course, here's on the left-hand side, we have the, the cairn, the commemorative cairn and the graveyard. You can see some of the stones just in the sort of central uh, foreground. Uh, and then you can see in the middle, Achnakari Cottage built in 1934. Uh, and just to the right of that, you'll see the roof of Old Leonich. Uh, here and just the newly constructed what was our old visitor center um, just uh, off screen there. Achnakari was, uh, was effectively after the commemorative cairn and clan graveyard area was a sort of visitor focus. It, it served cups of tea, it became a tea shop, about 8,000 cups of tea, something like that were served in one year. Um, the trust bought it and demolished it um, in order to um, the views uh, from there and there was, there's, there's quite good uh, discussion of that whole process of how bits of ground have come and gone uh, and how views have been opened up so I think a very positive thing to get rid of that cottage I think you'll the, I mean the, the, the battlefield is much uh, uh, better visit if, um, if without that cottage being there and of course, in the, when it was demolished in 1972, um, the idea was because this new visitor center, which is our old visitor center, had been built uh, beside the, um, the existing road, which at the bottom right hand side of this, these images, you can see quite clearly that the old road still existing through the clan grave area. Uh, and that was only moved uh, in the 1980s to further to the north, as, as Christopher mentioned. But you can see the old Leonich dwarf by this uh, uh, white, um, brightly painted building in the middle of the battlefield, and we sort of forget that just how you know how imposing it was as a as a as a feature, and a, you know uh, had a, an impact on the landscape, no doubt about that. So I think again, probably a useful thing that it was it was taken away, and of course it's been replaced by our our new visitor centre, which um, the it was set into the landscape a lot better uh, um, you can hear, see here it's uh, pitching down with the, uh, the, the the hills in the background on the south side of the river Nairn uh, to try and blend in and sit back behind the government to the south of the government deployment and it has some wonderful uh, architectural features I really like the wall with the sitting out, sticking out stones that relate to the number of casualties on the day at the battle you know the 1200 
uh, Jacobites, at least in the and the government casualties too. And you can compare and contrast the two groupings of stones are, are, are very, very subtle. And I think often uh, maybe people don't notice it, but when you do get told about it, you never forget it. I think it's fantastic. Of course, the archaeology has has had a, a has a um, we've done lots of work there. I'm not going to talk about lots of that because um, there are people better placed to, to do that. Um, over the years, two men in a trench, uh, various little bits of watching briefs, but also work undertaken in advance uh, of the construction of the new visitor centre and for interpretation purposes. Lots of metal detecting, uh, detailed metal detecting uh, to find hundreds of musket balls of different calibers relating to different uh, sides. Uh, and one or two, that I know Tony think, uh, often uh, suggests this is one of his favorite artifacts ever, this future cross uh, found close to uh, where the Athol Brigade uh, were stationed uh, against the top end of the, the, the Leon enclosure. Um, so lots of very good tangible remains and often, uh, as he would say, visceral uh, um, evidence of, of battlefields and, and engagements. Um, so uh, the, the cross there again, uh, some of the musket balls, bayonets, um, and a lot of this material, and I have to thank uh, uh, and Natasha Ferguson here, who did the cataloging of it all uh, and produced our catalogues of all uh, the material from the, uh, um, the visitor center research work, uh, which includes all these flattened and cut um, uh, musket balls that would expand and cause horrendous wounds uh, um, once they'd left the muzzle of the gun. So musket balls, pistol balls, there's some of the split ones, um, bits of grape shot, bits of canister, uh, a bottom of a, 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 a canister case, pistol shot, and a piece of a, a cohorn mortar shell, as Christopher was mentioning. And again, some more of these um, uh, very evocative items, the, the cross in the top left and the, um, the trigger guard of a brown bass musket that had been hit, impacted by a musket ball in the bottom right. So lots, lots of work, but when you see it start mapping it, um, it actually we've only looked at a tiny proportion of the battlefield. Um, I quite like this map, but this is the uh, battlefield as protected uh, by Historic Environment Scotland uh, by their designation of historic battlefields in 2012, uh, which shows the area obviously around Culloden House and also the wider battlefield. The Trust owned this patch in the middle, which is what I was showing you around the, the cairn here, but of course it extends much wider. And of course, battlefields are difficult to put lines around because in fact, there is the advance and there is the retreat and the, the route to, and, and the chase back to Inverness and the, 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 uh, the, the withdrawal of some of the troops as Christopher described over pieces of this ground. And that is uh, uh, illustrated in, in some of these very simplistic diagrams uh, in the uh, battlefield inventory, which is, find that and that's a way you've, you've got to represent these things. Um, what I, I quite like this slide that I, I put together. Um, you would think this is, um, is a military movement uh, of some sort of troop type, uh, but in fact what it is, it is the retreat of the visitor centre. As the National Trust for Scotland land uh, expands in, this, in the centre, um, it goes from being the, the cairn is still the focus, but in fact, you know, people used to visit that as the primary focus. And then, of course, it moved to Achnacarry Cottage and Old Leonach, and then the old visitor centre that was from 1970 to 2007, and then to the current visitor centre there. So, um, as we understand more and more, um, what we do is we reinterpret and we um, obviously have less and less of an impact on, on the battlefield as, as, as far as we can. What I want to do now is just turn quickly to the, the LIDAR survey that work that we've been doing. And that is a, looking at, it's a mapping a, a exercise. Um, and what we've done is we've taken the, and it was done a few years ago now, uh, and uh, the, the, it was funded uh, by work, uh, money raised from the, the work of the Visitor Centre itself and, uh, um, and commissioned by uh, the, the property manager at the time, Andrew, um, Mackenzie, uh, uh, and it's a, a, a fantastic resource for us to do further research uh, or at Culloden. Uh, and it's a mapping exercise. Basically, you fly a plane and you fire a laser out of it, it bounces back and it gives you 16 three-dimensional points per meter 
uh, in this case, so you can build up the sort of micro topography of the site. And what it can also do is it can strip away landscape features. So you can take away tree cover uh, and buildings so you can see more of the, the topography. And if, as uh, Christopher has already shown, topography is key to understanding battles. Uh, what people could see, where they were positioned, what sort of hollows in the ground were, what slowed people down, what where, 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 where was footing good, where was footing bad. We initially used it to focus particularly on the clan cemetery site here. Um, as you can see, this is the, the old road filled in now as it ran through uh, the centre of the clan grave area, a bank around here, the commemorative cairn, um, and each of the individual clan graves, as I showed on the, the map at, at the start of the Ordnance Survey map. In fact, so detailed that you can actually see the individual stones showing uh, as, uh, as features on the, on, the, uh, on the LIDAR data there. It's um, lit with light, just like the old maps, it's lit with light standardly here from the northwest. Um, and what we can then do is we can start to play about with it. And so not just using the three-dimensional side of the LIDAR, we, we can overlay it onto um, uh, historic maps and different use different um, mapping uh, exercises that we've undertaken to record things like archaeological features, previous work on the site, that sort of thing. So here we have the Ordnance Survey map, again, of the uh, turn of the last century, about 1900. Um, with the clan graves area in the centre, the old road running through um, a plantation of, of woodland or uh, there, the open field of the field of the English. Uh, and what we've done is we've overlaid that directly. And as I merge it into the background, what you can start to see is how the, the landform starts to appear using the, the three-dimensional LIDAR data. So this is the old road running through. Uh, this is the clan graves in the centre here. That's the road that was put through in the 80s as it curves around the back. Um, that's the car park for the old visitor centre. The visitor centre's in here, old Leonich in about here. That's the, the, um, the what do you call it, a bund uh, that leads up to the roof of the current visitor centre, which is here and the car park. But also what you can see in the background is the geology. Um, and that uh, very much links into what Christopher was saying about the boggy hollows, uh, particularly in this area over here. We can see this is, these are, uh, are streamlets or boggy areas, uh, and this coming down this side, emptying down uh, off the ridge down into the Nairn, River Nairn Valley uh, to the south uh, east and heading down to the coast uh, on the, the northwest side of the ridge. So it's very useful for uh, getting an ideal idea of topography, uh, but you can then start to look at it from uh, current, uh, this is digital photography taken at the same time as the LIDAR, it uh, can be used to uh, uh, plot um, current uh, land use, so we can see quite clearly see the current uh, conifer plantations uh, to the northwest, uh, to the southwest, the area of the central part of the battlefield and the visitor centre, uh, and the areas of uh, arable and pastoral fields around it. And what we were able to do is then take that, produce contour maps, um, so we can use the 3D data to, to produce contours through that data, uh, allowing us to understand the, the, um, the contour and the gradients uh, in, in order to understand how, how, what troops would be, where they would be positioned and what they would see. Uh, and what we've done here is we've taken Christopher's uh, previous map, not the one he's just shown, but the, um, uh, an earlier version of it, uh, and overlaying that onto uh, the, the topography as outlined by the, uh, the LIDAR data. Kilwiniak enclosure down here, and if I zoom through, um, where we think the corner of the Culloden parks, although it was demolished, um, we think is somewhere in this area here. The King Stables uh, cottage is in this in this area, uh, just this area here. Yes, um, and the two blue lines here, dots here are pretty much um, where all those maps show the initial um, uh, uh, lining up of the Jacobite line uh, is on in the landscape, and that's old Leonich, as I mentioned right at the start of the talk. 
So what we've got here, uh, and this is something we'll be working on more and more in for the future, and it's quite nicely because it fits in beautifully with uh, um, Christopher's um, uh, uh, last slide. It's looking at the viewpoint of the French gun, that one single lone cannon that held off uh, some of the uh, government uh, horse from uh, uh, pursuing the McDonald's on the left flank um, for quite enough time to let them uh, to get clear of the field. And what, what's shown here is the, the troop positions, but also the orange here is what could be seen from that single position uh, at a height of about one meter 50 or two meters high. So from what a, your standard person would see. So there's, there's, there are big gaps. You see there are hollows that things probably wouldn't be seen into, although it depends on how tall you are and whether you're carrying a flag, whether you're standing, whether you're on a horse or not. All these things need to be taken into consideration. And that, that is our next set of processes to start to work with Christopher to, I, to start to look at where we want to try and get different viewpoints from. So that's from the French gun position looking, well, looking all around it. And the other thing we all have to put, take into consideration is the, is the height of some of the, 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 the park walls because they would obviously obscure things. But what this neatly shows is the north uh, northeast southwest uh, line of uh, the ridge of Culloden and how the land falls away on either side and that you could see you know there's the, from the the, the, the the Jacobite left flank there was no way they could see what was happening uh, on the on the right flank uh, and then this is uh, the same doing the same thing a view shed analysis from the center of the second line of the government troops here, what could be seen from that position there, which is probably not far off where Cumberland was at portions of the battle. And here again, you see the same viewpoints. Some of the hollows are, have been picked out. Uh, more work needs to be done, uh, but it's starting to, um, to show uh, exactly what we can, we can start to play about with once we get this in. And this is all done, and I have to thank uh, uh, Graham Cavers of AOC Archaeology for putting this all together uh, as a, a GIS package so we can run through things. So not just how can we put the troop types on, but we can also play about with the uh, evidence, the archaeological evidence. This is Tony Pollard uh, uh, and Ian Banks uh, metal detecting survey work um, plotted on to the LiDAR stuff. Uh, and here uh, with the GIS, you can start to play around uh, and look uh, across the material uh, and interrogate it, looking at different types of objects, where they were found. Uh, but also you get an idea of just how small the area is that we've looked at. And then you can click on individual items. And here we have the, the troop position, uh, the, the position of the cross as it was found uh, um, at the, the far southwest of the metal detecting survey area. And just to finish, um, this is the sort of thing that also we can do, and thanks to AOC for this as well. Um, we can use the LiDAR data to start 3D modeling and changing the light direction. Uh, or we, can take the, we can turn the uh, digital photography on, which can be helpful sometimes, but we can turn it off too uh, and start to play about with it to look at the different viewpoints. And again, you'll see the topographic features coming through uh, on that. And that's, I mean, what the, the power of this material is great and that we've now got this 3D model for uh, an area of about four uh, kilometers square within the big loop of the, Culloden, uh, the the railway line, the Highland railway line, the Inverness railway line that whole end of the of the of the ridge is modeled now and we can start to use it to tell more of a story about the battle of Culloden. and i'll just stop there i just wanted to say thanks very much again to all the people who have have input to this and particularly to christopher himself who has helped fund some of the work fantastic thank you derek um I think it's really exciting, this position we're in now. There is so much we can learn uh, from this information um, and from this data. And I think the, the scope is endless. But as I said earlier, I'm no expert. And we are lucky enough today also to have with us Professor Murray Pittock, 
from Glasgow University. Um, Murray's a Bradley Professor and Pro Vice Principal at University of Glasgow. He's also a board member of the National Trust for Scotland and he is our his, uh, Scottish History Advisor. He also advises at National Museum, National Galleries and Museums Galleries of Scotland, a variety of overseas institutions and agencies. He has an incredibly long list of appointments from all over the world by the looks of it, which I'm not going to go into today because we have a limited amount of time. So apologies, Murray. I will though say that he is another, along with Christopher, one of the, 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 the global mm -hmm. authorities on Cabal, um, currently researching the global history of Scotland for Yale and the British Army in Scotland, 1746 to 60. Um, Professor Pittock, I'd, I'd like to ask you, if we may, to just reflect on what Christopher and Derek have presented and what this might mean for us here at Cologne. Delighted, well, to, uh, to uh, go through some of the most interesting and original presentations on Culloden that uh, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to hear here or anywhere else. And I think this is a real, uh, uh, really brilliant to see the extent to which the trust uh, has foregrounded uh, original research today. It's, it's wonderful to see. So to take first of all, uh, Christopher's excellent forensic address and set some, to set some context for that, um, one of the things that uh, Michael Russell did as a culture Cabinet Secretary of the Scottish Government was to begin, was to authorize the Scottish Battlefields Register, which uh, reported and was set up in 2011, and which should have provided uh, much better evidence than previously existed and did provide uh, for the extent of Culloden Battlefield. But because that didn't involve any kind of legislative protection, uh, and it only meant though that planning authorities should take notice of the existence of the battlefields register and to what extent that taking notice uh, had any effect was really up to the planning authority concern. It was proven to be a broken reed when the critical issue of planning development at Culloden, which Professor Duffy highlighted, View Hill, the View Hill development, uh, went through the entire uh, planning system in 2017. And to just relate that development at View Hill to uh, the couple of the maps that Professor Duffy showed, I think the York map looks as if it was on the original disposition of the troops. But if you notice on the York map or you remember, uh, the Jacobite left overlaps uh, the British army right. Uh, and in doing so, it presented a threat which Cumberland countered by bringing up uh, Cobham's dragoons uh, across the back of the third line to, uh, with some other units to reinforce Kingston's light horse and his command post on the right. The ground over which they moved and off, for, over which they subsequently charged an attempt to create a double envelopment of the Jacobite army, which was, as we so eloquently heard, hindered by de Sousse's four pounder gun at the edge of Culloden Park enclosures, that ground is the ground on which View Hill stands. That ground is cover, covers uh, uh, movements of British cavalry. So that was a significant, that's a significant intrusion onto the historic space of the battlefield. And I think that what Professor Duffy's paper brings home to us is the extent to which uh, we, uh, uh, the, interpretation of the battlefield as a National Trust for Scotland site has been absolutely central to the way the, N the NTS has protected and developed it over the last 85 years. But it's been too easy for people to think that the site is the site that the National Trust for Scotland owns, which actually has itself changed significantly with the purchase of additional land since the 1930s. As we've seen today, that site is about one third of the total battle site. And it's very, very important to realize that in conserving Culloden is not about conserving the National Trust for Scotland Culloden, it's helping the National Trust for Scotland to conserve all of Culloden and to resist uh, the planning applications which continue to be made and which have recently been made on the lines of Jacobite, of Jacobite retreat and on the Jacobite, uh, by the Jacobite second line. So if we look at some of the salient things in uh, Professor, uh, Professor Duffy's uh, 
important contribu contribution. One of the things that you would notice, and not only is that that new King Stables Road travels really from the Jacobite first to second line, but I think those maps and their interpretation bring home to us the fact that the Jacobite first line is so much larger than the second line and was so much, it was absolutely critical that it was successful in the first phase of the action because the Jacobites had no effective reserves. And although the Elko and Fitzjames cavalry screen, because of the contours of the land, which brings up a very useful point that Derek Alexander raised about what you can see from where you're standing, because the line shifts contour towards the Nairn by around about 15 meters, um, actually helped to screen the Jacobite second line and to conceal its inadequacy from the uh, British cavalry advance on that wing. And those things on both wings, uh, the, gun on, the gun at Culloden Parks prevented, prevented the envelopment on the British right and the uh, cavalry screen prevented the impetus of the envelopment on the British left. Those things helped to stop the envelopment which would have killed far more Jacobites than actually died, though goodness knows those, those were enough. So I think that, that you've had visualized there a really, good, uh, a really good overview of the battle comparing the Jacobite army so strong on its front line with the British army so strong over three lines of, uh, uh, three lines of assembly. And again, the very important point about the composition of the Jacobite army, that although we have put up in the Victorian period clan graves and, uh, uh, and memorials for clans, the Jacobite army was in regimental format and many of those who enrolled in the different regiments uh, were not necessarily from the localities in which the, uh, the feudal magnates who had raised them uh, came from. Moreover, even when they were, they were often conventionally organized. For example, MacDonald Glengarry's in, in uh, as well as two other Jacobite regiments had grenadier companies. So they were very, in that sense, a conventional organization. But if you want to think of the size that we really need to look at at the battlefield and think of the battlefield in terms of, it also helps to visualize just how many men, roughly 12 to 14,000 were on the battle, were on the battlefield on that fateful day in 1746. Because again, it's quite clear that if you think about how they would be spaced out, it's quite impossible for them actually all to have stood on the National Trust for Scotland site. So I think that those points are really brilliantly and strongly visually brought home by Professor Duffy's presentation of the development and the speed of development of the battle. And I think we need, we need to continue to ensure that uh, the Scottish government, especially after the upcoming uh, election in Scotland on the 6th of May and others are really apprised of the, sheer, of the scale of the battle and the integration of the battlefield as a whole to the way in which uh, uh, we need to preserve, protect, and conserve it. To reflect somewhat on, uh, uh, also on Derek Alexander's paper, I think there, was one, there were two really, really excellent things there. First of all, the, the LIDAR, which we need to dwell on, I think, the LIDAR data, the looking at the uh, development of the contours of the battle, the way that the LIDAR data seriously reinforces uh, the integration and synthesis of the mapping data. I don't think we need to be any longer in any doubt about the extent over which the battle ranged because we have confirmation from so many different sources. But one of the other things that was really important in what uh, uh, Derek Alexander talked about was the memorialization of the battle, the way we remember the battle, which has changed so much. It's very nice to see um, Achna Kare were, which uh, with its tea room, which didn't disappear till 1972, and obviously is very much closer to the scene of the action than any, than any current planned development. But what we're looking at there is the National Trust for Scotland Conservation, which helped to develop a situation where the battlefield had all its extraneous buildings removed, and indeed, of course, helped to relocate the road in 1981. But that, that, that removal, was part of a cycle of conservation, which is now under pressure and being, uh, uh, being attacked from without. And I think that we've, that's one of the important cycles of memory we need to reverse. 
we moved to a situation where we conserve more and more and more and more of Culloden, and now we're being it's being it, it's being uh, put under threat by those who would like to conserve it less and less and less. Why they would like to do that, I think I'll just reflect on at the end. I think the, one of the interesting things about Culloden is that it wasn't really particularly remembered until the centenary of 1846. And actually, the, when the initial uh, stone was laid for the cairn that became the Forbes Memorial in 1881, it was a weeping woman and child, uh, who, which was the intention uh, to be put up, very much because that was, that was the shape of the way Irish famine monuments were beginning to go. And the, the date, 19th September 1849, when that uh, initial stone was laid in the cairn, was actually at, uh, towards the end of the West Highland potato famine, which suffered from exactly the climatic problems which affected much more seriously, though seriously enough in the West Highlands, Ireland in that period. So that in a way, uh, the original memorial, which didn't get enough money to be developed as a weeping woman and child and ended up being a cairn 30 years later, is also part of the suffering of the West Highlands in the late, 1840, in the late 1840s. The, those of you who have been wa who watched some of the very interesting photographs that uh, Derek Alexander put up will also have seen not only uh, on the, as will be familiar to many of, to many of us, uh, the, on the Cairn, uh, the Highlanders who fought for Scotland and Prince Charlie commemorated, but also at King's Stables, um, the King's Stables uh, plaque, that this is a sta station of the uh, where English cavalry, and of course the term Field of the English. And this brings me to the vexed, uh, you know, the vexed nomenclature which has surrounded Culloden. And one of the fascinating things about it is that it has been largely remembered as, for most of its history, when it began to be remembered, as fundamentally a, uh, uh, an Anglo-Scottish conflict. And that's, that's still in some of the memorial, the memorials and the names, the battle. And it became, started to be predominantly remembered as a civil war roughly from the 1960s and 70s. It used to fit into, constitutionally speaking, a narrative about, about uh, Scotland and Britain, which was irreversible. And when it appeared that there was a challenge, a constitutional challenge in the current date of that narrative, it actually, it became remembered in a rather different way. Um, so that's, an in that's, interesting, that's an interesting feature in itself, the way in which the battle is remembered and how it's remembered remains very, very important. And to take you back to a much earlier stage, when the current Lenach cottage was reconstructed out of the stones of the Lenach enclosure in 1868, that was the same year that Queen Victoria requested Cumberland's statue be taken down in Cavendish Square. So uh, a, a different parts, very different parts of this island Culloden was being recreated uh, for the, its defeated, while its victor was being taken out of public view. You think that the current issues over um, BLM protests and the war of the statues are uh, uh, in the United States over commemorating the Confederacy are a new thing. They're not a new thing. Um, Cumberland statue didn't in Cavendish Square didn't survive 1868, just as Lenach was being reconstructed. So how we remember the battle has always been a political issue, but the, but the conservation of the battle should not be a political, uh, a political football. And I think that, that uh, brings me on to uh, discussing the motives behind any, a threat to its conservation. Now, I think those are, those are fundamentally twofold. Uh, first of all, and this is important, uh, nearly all polling evidence, including the Trust's own polling evidence, shows that people in Scotland do not feel they know enough of their own history. And one of the things that happens if people don't know enough of their own history is they can't value what they don't know. But also there is the case that when the history is known, people do not necessarily value it either. So I think those, it is a, we are in a position in Scotland where we take enormous resources in terms of uh, heritage, battlefields, castles, uh, 
things that attract tourists from landscape to museums, uh, museums and galleries for granted too often. And I think we don't, we need not to take them for granted and we need the help of a national and international audience to, to do that and to support us in not taking them in not taking them for granted and making sure that nobody else takes them for granted either. And I think there's a third thing too, which is, and I confess that I've uh, not only a, a, a role in, in Culloden, that's the cover of the Folio Society edition of my Oxford study of Culloden, which is due out in a couple of months uh, just behind me. Not just an interest in Culloden, but in, but in an interest in uh, the economic impact of our culture and tourism uh, on Scotland's economy too. And I think the third thing, which people really do need to understand much better when they give planning permission, is that there is a significant economic impact to sites which are unspoilt and where people can realize their history, their heritage, and their past, or where they can find themselves or encounter a tradition in a way which isn't intruded upon by new development, by shopping malls, by luxury housing developments, uh, by, uh, by hotels and restaurants. That is why people visit. People who stay overnight are absolutely centrally important to the Scottish economy. The longer you stay, the more you spend. That's when any of us visit anywhere. And quite simply, sometimes decisions are made which do not reflect the damaging impact that that can have or would have on what is, in this case, despite the fact for many people who live in the UK, it's extremely remote, the most visited battle site in the UK. It's a critically important site for the Highland economy. So this isn't just a sentimental plea about history. This is a plea, or not a plea, but an argument that we, don't, we need to value and encounter our past for its own sake, for the sake of all those who think that their ancestors or whose ancestors did fight at Culloden or were displaced by the changes in Scotland and Scottish land use that happened after Culloden. And also because right now it's a benefit to the Scottish economy, it creates jobs, it sustains businesses, and we have no business trying to damage that for no better reason than to develop housing on a, uh, on a site close to a rapidly expanding town, but one with a great deal of room still around it. So we need, I think, I, I would ask everyone to, uh, to support uh, uh, financially, morally, or otherwise, the trust's campaign to do that. And that to, to also to ask you if you are on social media, to share your finding, uh, share the findings you've heard today, or uh, your own views on social media platforms, because we really do need to inform people as much as possible about the real extent of Culloden, the real nature of our history, and the threat to it, and the threat to it from development. And as you've heard from Professor Christopher Duffy, um, the Scottish government's own reporter, uh, carelessly. And that's, uh, I think, our general view here, carelessly let through the View Hill development, which hasn't, as it has been developed, even, uh, be, uh, even met the terms under which planning permission was granted, since it was meant to be invisible from the battlefield. But actually, as I know, because I stood beside the Forbes Cairn last week, you can turn, you can turn right and see where Cobham's, uh, uh, where Cobham's Dragoons and Kingston's Light Horse stood, and it's the gable end of a luxury house. And that cannot be right from the point of view of, our, of genealogy, history, or for any of us. So I'd just like to thank both our speakers today, both Professor Christopher Duffy and Derek Alexander for the sterling work they've done. I think we've all had a tremendous treat in this session from the point of view of uh, uh, encountering fresh research hosted by the National Trust for Scotland. To ask you to support the National Trust for Scotland and also uh, to note that if anyone is interested in the history or genealogy of, um, uh, Scottish, uh, of Scottish troops or Scots who fought in the rising of 1745 or indeed at other times in the Jacobite movement, 
There's good work on the uh, in the Jacobite database in 1745 from Darren Lane on the on the army, and there is you can Google it. I haven't got the uh, I haven't got the the means to put the link up on the screen, but if you Google Jacobite officers database, you'll find uh, you'll find my database database of Jacobite officers who served in every rising from 1689 onwards. So using those two resources together will help you take a first base uh, to perhaps identify a relation uh, or a family member who stood at some point in Scotland or Ireland or England with the Jacobite cause, which changed the history of the country we live in and which is a history we need to preserve from the, for all the world, given the importance of Culloden and what happened after it to the Scottish diaspora in every corner of the globe. So thanks very much to Ryle and Katie for hosting this and thank you very much for listening this morning. And, and, and thank you, Professor Pittock. Um, very strong words and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and thanks to, to all the speakers. We're gonna have a, a, a Q and A session in a minute. And please, any of you, if you can think of any questions that you want to ask, if you can just type them into the chat box um, and we'll get do our best to, to, to get to them. Um, in terms of fundraising, I would like to make an unashamed puff for your help, please. We have launched a new fundraising campaign, which is working internationally in Britain. It is the Culloden Fighting Fund, and you can access it via nts.org.uk. Uh, in the States, it's the Conserve Culloden Fund. And if you look at the NTS USA Foundation for that, please. Um, we have so much we want to do now with this research, and we really would like to get going with things like regular archaeology summer schools, with research assistants to help Derek now get on the case with the contours and the LIDAR and the many, many layers of history that we still have to uncover. Uh, it's phenomenally exciting. It just makes the whole experience that much more rich. Um, and it makes our job that much more enjoyable as well. Uh, Professor Pittock talked about Culloden's value to the local economy. Well, in 2019, we recorded three, well, more than 300,000 visitors to the battlefield as a whole. Um, the battlefield's open 24-7. Uh, inside the centre, we got more than 220,000 visitors. Uh, that, to me, I've worked on hundreds of heritage sites in, in my career. That's phenomenal, because it's 220,000 people who actually want to come in, uh, pay for the exhibition, and learn about the story and learn about the history of the Battle of Culloden, not just see it. Um, we have more than 80% international visitors in, in a normal year before COVID. And just before the lockdown, I was having some fascinating meetings with Chinese tour groups, Indian tour groups, who had Culloden as top of the list. Um, the story of the battle is universal, no matter what, what, what country or culture you're from. Um, it's a tragic story, but it's, its resonance is as real today as it was the day after. So I'm... Um, going to kick off the, the panel discussion. We're going to run to um, about one o'clock and then, then we'll take a break before the next session. One thing I've learned from this, and we also explored it on a very cool day when Professor Pittock was up last week, um, the battle itself, we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot by talking about a core area and a central bit where we imagine the fiercest fighting took place. And from a planning perspective, it's a nightmare because we're, we're then in danger of seeing one area was more important than another. Um, I'd like to kick off by asking firstly Christopher, but then, then we'll work around. Was there a core to the Battle of Culloden? Did it spread over a, a large area like we think it does now? And Christopher, if you're going to unmute yourself, please, Christopher. <laughs> I'm duly unmuted. I feel much more vigorous now. Thank you very much. Uh, core area. Uh, uh, no, this is, a, this is a great problem. Uh, the beloved of the developers is the notion of the core area, which originated, I won't mention by whom, in the year uh, 2013, seized on immediately by developers and their highly professional assistants, which they identify with the land in the keeping of the National Trust. And these two means, the core area and the trust area, have become completed. And the government of parties stated so many words, essentially nothing of any interest happened between the Few Hills site and the National Trust area. No events, nothing recording events, nothing of significance whatsoever. 
And this has helped to give the green light to, to what's been going on at Culloden. Now, the, there are three distinct landscapes of Culloden. We have the, the trust ownership, owned, trust owned land, which is not typical, it's high, well drained on the whole. To the north, we have the, the wetlands, completely different landscape. To the south, we have the fertile, almost Somerset like landscape descending to the land. And all the visitors know, all the public know, is the central so called core area, which is not typical of, of the landscape. So hundreds of thousands of visitors come away with a totally artificial or limited sense of the extent of the battlefield. Um, passing on to that more general point, um, what we know about the battlefield is of assistance to Noah, but essentially the only measure of protection worth anything at all, worth anything at all, is to actually own the land. It's the only thing which counts in this hard world. Physically owning the land is the only reasonable guarantee of protection. Everything else is vulnerable. And the sheer effort of fighting off successive Applications of development coming as if on a, 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 a revolving path is too great for people to sustain. We cannot keep up this effort. We're putting forth many of to fight off these developments. Physically, it's, mentally, it's not possible for us to do so. I've known three people whose health has been affected adversely by this. And we cannot sustain this. We need to have, basically, we need to own the land. Nothing should be that around. Um, Professor Pittock, on, on the question of core, and I've asked you, yeah. <laughs> I, I, fundamentally, uh, I, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Duffy, but I think that the important thing for us to understand is contour, to take it to, to Derek Alexander's point, and the battlefield itself under the NTS actually lacks most many of the contours that determined the action and that's something that people i think really need to bear really need to bear in mind the geography of the battle as well as the 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 alleged center of it is artificial but the critical element is the cavalry flanking and the cavalry encirclement is completely absent from the land the nts own and it was the critical moment in terms of uh, the the nature and extent of the victory. Eric, yes, I, I would I would agree with all those statements. Uh, I mean, I think the, the the trouble with core and periphery and all that side of things is that you know battlefields are very difficult things at the best of times to understand because they are fluid, uh, and you know putting a pin on a map doesn't doesn't help. Of course the People think of, of the clan grave area where, you know, very close to which the vast majority of casualties were inflicted as being, you know, quite rightly a very significant point on the battlefield. And that's where, you know, commemoration has focused. But uh, Murray's exactly right in terms of the, if you want to understand battlefields, you need to understand terrain and landscape and the movements of the troops and the different troop types through those landscapes and what could be seen and what couldn't be seen. Uh, and those, uh, as he rightly says, we, we, the Trust, National Trust for Scotland looks after the sort of central spine ridge, uh, but you, what you're not seeing is, that, is where actually the key movements were on either side. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, I mean, it's a big bit of ground. And then and once you start to think about, you know, the retreats and the advance, I mean, the advance of the government forces is, you know, incredibly calculated. I mean, it was, an, it was a, quite a maneuver uh, and that's, you know, that ground is, is, is well beyond the sort of limits of, of where we are. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a difficult thing, but the, I think the more that is protected, the better. For sure, for sure. Um, and that moves on to one, another question, really. You talked quite a bit about view shed analysis, and we're talking a lot about the contours. Uh, if I could start with you, Derek, and work backwards. Um, what, can you just explain a bit more about what a, what, a, what a view shed analysis is and also the light angles and contours? How does the, the LIDAR help with that? 
So uh, first of all, view shed analysis is basically it's what you can what can be seen from a single point uh, in the landscape. So because you've got a three D model and it's it's you know it's, it's it's got so each of the points that the lidar has given us has has a has th has three coordinates as an x coordinate, a y coordinate. So you know where it is on a in, in a mapping sense, but also it has a height. So within that, we can model what the height of the ground is. If you then raise it up by one, you know, by six foot, or if you want to say one meter eighty or something like that, to about the rough height of you know an adult, um, you can then say, well, what can this person see of the ground from this position? So what that's giving you is a view, and it, what you're seeing there in those in those images that I showed you is is what bits of the ground are visible. What it's not showing you is, um, and we can start to play about with that, is if you start giving other things heights as well. So if you give if you give a block of troops a height of so 100 or 200 or 500 men in a, in a battalion or regiment, um, if you give them a height of two meters, then, you know, they will block the view of, of if you're standing in front of them, you won't be able to see what's behind them. Now that's that's battlefields the world over. That is that is a that's a big issue. But there are landscape features that block views as well. So the parks, the Culloden parks, the Kilwinnie enclosure, which we think was about six foot high stone built walls, that would block views too. Uh, as the drop in the contour goes away quite quickly, um, that would that that has a limiting view. So we can then start to test how far along the Jacobite line you would be able to see the right flank. Uh, would you be able to see any of the cavalry movement? I mean, they were aware of people coming, some of the units coming through the Kalwinia enclosures. Um, and the other thing, and I was talking to uh, Christopher about this the other day, is um, you've got to think of this is why this is why you know military units carry flags, so they can be seen by their commanders. Uh, and and we can start to play about with that. So what I mean, could the Jacobites in the middle? What could they see the the pennons of the of the of the cavalry coming around uh, uh, through the Kilwinnock enclosures? How far away could they see it? That so that's the sort of thing you can start to do once you have this three D model, and that's we're just starting to uh, explore that side of things. And that's um, I mean, we we obtained the data quite a few years ago. It's taken a wee while to get together, and as ever with the with the trust that we've got. We've got some funding to pull this GIS side of it, which is layering all the maps on top of each other. And one of those layers, just one of those layers is the, is the GIS data. And that has those the contours and we can start to, to play about with that. And I've forgotten what your second question was. <laughs> I, I think you're there. No, that, that's brilliant. Um, Professor Pittock, from your perspective. Great, you're on mute. Um, what I ju just, I think that's been very comprehensively stated. What I just like to say is, as a as a little note, talking about two meters, the average height of all enrolled men in the Jacobite Army was five feet five, and the shortest uh, a soldier who is subsequently transported uh, is four feet six. And there are a significant number of of soldiers between four feet six and five feet. So actually, you probably also need to factor in that people are very wee. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it, it's marginal, but in some cases it can be quite significant when you're looking at, at, at narrow contours. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to briefly uh, pick up something in the chat to say, uh, there's a question about John Roy Stewart, and just to say that uh, John Roy Stewart uh, commands the uh, so-called Edinburgh Regiment, John Roy Stewart's that day, but one of the interesting things about John Roy is that he fought uh, at Fontenoy. And one of the reasons why I use the term British Army is because so many of the regiments who fought with Cumberland that day had fought at Fontenoy in the War of the Austrian Succession the, in the previous year. And many of those on the Jacobite side, particularly those in the, in the French and Irish, uh, um, the, the Franco-Scottish and Irish forces had also fought opposite the British Army at, at, at Fontenoy. So that actually, by talking about Hanoverians and Jacobites rather than Jacobites and the British Army, we don't, we don't get the sense of this as an international conflict. And John Roy Stewart had actually been at Fontenoy. So he's very much part of this story. Okay, thank you. And Professor Duffy, from your perspective, 
I'm guessing more more viewshed analysis and, and contours would help massively. Uh, can you unmute, please, Christopher? Am I unmuted? That's it. Yep, thank you. <laughs> um, what's the question I had? Um, it just in in the presentations, uh, the, the terms view shed analysis and the light angles were mentioned frequently. And I just wondered if you could expand a bit more on that and, and what why is that relevant to? to oh, oh, very much so. Of course, it takes in for the first time we can reconstruct what people could see with any given station, any given height. Uh, on individual heights, uh, just rating of, of people relating to the Campbell who supported uh, the cavalry sweep to the south, uh, they were not the pick of the Campbell plan because the Campbell plan had been dissolved by the second Duke. They're very quickly raised uh, forces who the third Duke had to apologize for to the Duke of Cumberland. And the 64th Highland, the game from Argyllshire, was so much of the way of mini men they couldn't even load the regulation muskets because they were too long for them. So the government had to saw off musket barrels to enable these guys to actually load their own muskets. So relative heights of Highlanders and Loners, I think, are very important. Uh, but also the circumstances in which they were actually, actually raised. But the contours, absolutely, and what you could see uh, is decisive. And Five meters is more than enough to consume a massive force, even of cavalry. Uh, at the Battle of Kunersdorf, uh, in central uh, Poland nowadays, 1759, a mass of 3,000 Russian Austrian cavalry was concealed by a ridge only 10 feet high. And they led to the, they charged over this low rise in the ground and defeated the Prussian army. So this kind of information is absolutely crucial to understanding the battle. And no other historians that I know have appreciated this. So the, the military historical community itself needs to be shown. This is a vital element which must be borne into consideration whenever you're looking at a battle of fortified position. And here Culloden is a state to take the lead as I believe it is in other fields of battle research. We are there, we're here for that. The rest of the British historical community, British or American, has not applied this. We do, we're doing it. Great, thank you. I'm just picking up another couple of questions from the chat area. Um, is it possible or even feasible for the NTS or Historic Environment Scotland to place marker posts at key locations on the battlefield on parts that we currently don't own? Professor Duffy, what are your thoughts? I'm not, I'm not certain we would need to know the dispositions of the landowners. I think they'd be very unlikely to agree. Um, as we know, in effect, the right to roam doesn't actually seem to apply to the land. And here we cannot entirely blame the landowners, considering, bearing in, in mind, the falling damage inflicted by wild campers on the Clodden site and th throughout picturesque areas of Scotland. No wonder gates are barred. No wonder we have barbed wire fences. No wonder the staff of landowners are so hostile to intruders. They do have a point. Again, unless we actually own the land, we can't do anything about it. But meanwhile, I think we must respect the views and of responsibilities of neighboring landowners, to perhaps greater extent than we actually do. Because they give we, we need their cooperation sooner or later. And again, Acquiring land is the only thing which is of any value whatsoever. No other government counts. Can I, I just chip in there as well? I mean, obviously, a few years ago, I think I can't remember if it's a few years ago now, um, uh, we worked in partnership with, uh, with the Forestry Commission and things to put in a wider trail network uh, outside. Um, uh, Katie will probably know as well outside the, the, the bit that the National Trust for Scotland owns, which linked together some of the and gave views across some of the other elements of the battlefield, but didn't go across the ground. Um, so you know, partnerships like that all can 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 make a big difference as well. And I think that I mean that at the time that was that was a very useful thing. 
Uh, and the other thing I was going to just ask, I was if I can be cheeky, I was going to ask Christopher about because he on his map he talking about the um, about the landscape uh, on your map, Christopher. You had a little thing that said the knoll where the Irish, so the where the Irish pickets were stationed. I mean, that's exactly the sort of thing that we can uh, work in together. We can go and we can look on the lidar data to see exactly where we think. I mean, is the knoll is that actually, is that a, mentioned in historical accounts, or is it is that a, a position that you've identified from? Just no, some, at the ground. From my, some of my notes that I've got here, which I can't look up at the moment, is there, there's, there's a historical dimension of it. Right. That, see, that's, that's exactly the sort of thing that can do with the well, 3D model. By, now, that's just to add that the, the view shed view from that position of the French gun is absolutely staggering, wasn't it? I, I, that, that's an, another question I have about the French gun. Um, is the French gun, is that? brought up late from Culloden Parks? Yeah. Or is it a retiral from the gun position that was forming the, the Jacobite left? No, I, I, I'm looking at the inf information at the time, as I believe it was, was brought, brought up early, must have been brought up early, together with all the, all the gun detachment. Because otherwise they couldn't have prepared, prepared that position so extensively as they actually did. It came into action only towards the end of the battle. Mm -hmm. It was probably only towards the end of the battle, was it ready to uh, go into action? I, think I the, reckon they actually got them. One of the issues is with the four pounder is that it could fire much more rapidly than most of the most of the uh, Jacobite ordnance covering the front line. Yes. So that's one of the reasons it posed such a threat to the oncoming yeah. cavalry. Yes, the, the cartridges were in stout cartridge paper. Um, and with that, you could load far more quickly than, than it could previously. It was a very small gun, short barreled, uh, incredibly accurate. Uh, the, with that gun, the Jacobites parted an anchor cable of a British sloop in the Firth of Forth. Oh. Very accurate. Wow. And Jack, uh, French artillery, French ammunition was much better at that period than the British ones. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Um, we Still got a bit of time left. I'm just going to quickly move to another question we have around about the figure of 50, um, the, the, the number of British losses uh, in the British Army. The figure of 50 killed is often put around in the literature uh, and affirmed in a number of places. Where does this number come from? Professor Pittock, start please. Okay, it's the, it's the, um, it's the official number. I'd have to, the, one of the things you, it's worth noting is that quite a lot of British officers on the day, including Wolfe, um, recall casualties as being higher uh, than the actual official number. Uh, a significant number of the wounded appear to have, uh, appear to have died. Um, so I, I'm, I myself have always thought that some of the, those counted as wounded were in fact dead fairly, uh, dead fairly shortly afterwards. The size of the grave is too large really for 50 to be buried. And the, it's very difficult to know what the exact numbers were. There's also the argument that there was a concealment of um, friendly fire because of the use of cohorns in the second line into the melee that barrels and the Jacobite right formed. Um, so it's a, it's a guesstimate to say it might have been 200, uh, it might have been more in the region of 200. Uh, than, than 50. 50 is almost certainly, in my view, and on the, on the evidence that there is an underestimate. And also in terms of the official strength plus the active strength of British regiments on the field, because nearly all of them were below active strength, there is actually a bit of give and take as to how many troops <laughs> were actually there and how many actually disappeared. Yep. Professor, you have anything to add? I'll go along with all that. Okay, okay. and we have uh, some archaeology points in the chat box. Uh, question about Koenig and would that be a site that would be a value, of value to us through some archaeological surveying on? Um, I'm also going to add on what about the potential for the Culloden Park walls? To you, Derek, first, what would be your top, your top hit spots for archaeology <laughs> research? Very, very much so. Uh, would it be possible to have the, the battle map on the screen? Uh, what number was that? I can't remember. 
So come to the site, Derek. <laughs> yep. I mean, my top hit spots would be um, the corner of the Culloden Parks, obviously, because that's where the gun position was. That would be good to find because it would anchor quite a few parts of the, the battlefield. Um, the obviously the flank. If you could find the um, the areas where the uh, the walls were broken down of the uh, Kilwinnock enclosure, I think that would be a useful location. There's a couple of gaps. I think Tony had identified on the ground for those. Um, and I, I think more metal detecting work on the bit that the trust owns in terms of the area that was under, we talked with Tony Pollard about it, um, about uh, doing some experimental excavation work in there to, to check what the survival in the area that had been planted with conifers, that's where I would focus to initially. But I mean, there's, it's such a huge area that, you know, you really have to start narrowing it down, yes. Great, thank you. Professor Duffy? Yes, right here. Uh, I'll do those two points. Uh, the Clouden Parks wall, uh, very close to the, uh, the, the, the B9006. And I just wonder whether the possibility of, obviously, first priority to be given for metal detecting there and, and uh, unconventional digging archaeology and visualization, whatever. And, be wonderful to think, resulting from this, a reconstitution of this corner of the wall, if not on the actual site, very close to it, something which will be actually visited, uh, visible from the road. Uh, for is yes, very, very much so. And here, what we would find, if any surviving bullets would be um, just to the southeast of the Kokonuk farmstead, in the, in the open ground there. Because uh, this is where you find any bullets fired by the Stonywood uh, Battalion of the Aberdeenshire Regiment. Certainly, is a room for metal uh, metal detecting there. And I think proper engagement with the metal detecting community is, is very important, because this would undercut the destructive work carried out by unauthorized detect detectors that bring the good guys on, on board. Be huge an expert uh, asset to what the, the trust is doing at Scott. Trust is doing on that club. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to check how we're doing on time. We've got three minutes left. So I'm going to just we're move on this afternoon to discuss more about sense of place and the protection and the ways that we can protect the Lord. But while we've got these panelists present, I'm just going to ask Slightly naive question. We have touched on it before, but um, how powerful are the existing designations in the planning system? And what chance have we actually got of protecting Culloden through the existing mechanisms? Professor Duffy to start with. Uh, none. <laughs> and Derek. <laughs> I, I think it, that it's a lot better than it used to be. It's not It's not perfect, I think. I mean, I, th I, 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 I think it's... Um, it has highlighted the importance of numbers of sites. Of course, the, the thing about Culloden is it's the top end of the scale of battlefields in terms of significance. Um, I think probably the, what is in place has, uh, from the Historic Environment Scotland's Battlefield Register, has provided information about a lot more other sites that, that were under threat and are probably um, ha as less well, less well preserved than Culloden. Um, I think more could be done. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And I think understanding and uh, of the of again, as Murray said, the, about about the views of what you can see from where. I, I think I mean the the trust long term view and actually long term of people before the trust um, was to uh, was to open up views across the wider battlefield and you know and taking away some of the things that we have taken away has has improved that. Um, but it then opens up views that. Have been hidden for for years, um, and you can see a lot more. Um, so we need to think about it in a very careful way and construct. Uh, and I think, you know, view sight lines are very very important for battlefields and for their interpretation. So yeah, then I think protection needs to be strengthened. But uh, also when uh, planning permission is granted, 
that there needs to be conditions that things are screened or built in such a way that they don't stand out like sore thumbs. Um, so that's 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 something I think probably could be improved. And Professor Pitak, your opinion of designations? First of all, there I think there are three issues here. The first is statutory. The legal the legal protection can be improved, and it and uh, the Scottish government is the place to go to press for that. The second is is understanding an outlook, and the issue that we need to ensure that people. Uh, don't don't make bad decisions because they value the history too little, or they or they understand it too. Uh, they understand it too little. And the third is um, public global pressure and acknowledgement of which sometimes the idea of Culloden being a World Heritage Site is a shorthand, and that may be important, but it's not statutory. However, it really makes people sit up and think. However, what I would say to anyone listening to this internationally. Is that, is that people who often make these decisions simply do not understand how globally important this battlefield is. So make your voice heard. This is a globally important battlefield and it's not a matter for a decision about where a building in, Inver in Inverness goes. We need also to be, we need also to um, not to be ambiguous or ambivalent. Unsuitable development is what uh, we need to oppose. But unsuitable development on Culloden Battlefield itself is all development on Culloden Battlefield itself, because we need to be absolutely clear cut about that, mm -hmm. consistent in our messaging throughout. Thank you for that. And thanks to all my fellow panel members. Um, and thanks for a fantastic morning. It's been a real privilege. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground. Um, as Katie just added in the chat box, if you've got any follow up questions, Please, you can email us at culloden at nts.org.uk. We can pass them on to all the panellists uh, who will be very approachable and, and open to questions. Um, I just want to thank everybody for listening in. We're going to take a break now uh, and come back at 1.15 for the next session, which will be on protecting sense of place. And that'll be compared by Katie. Thanks all. Thank you. Relative lie, they've got a catch of virtue of a cat show in Fiagadul. A common Gallic Lenish is the Vicuma Lingeneva show for Nunkia Jerk Fikita Kog is the Sardinia Sashkis Law of Law. Gimme Ostenach Savarst Davilis Fikit, who will call it a sewer lacking, it was good shop back in the Geneva Shahumal. A Russian son of E as a noon to Yahu Shaw Bliona, Skatahel Koramakin. Jeder wish a hummel as a doy avish yoch, and me of such tolliture give a caramacking in Jedevish a thrift school, either in Yetter Leon, Covantor, Colady, or as Nashant the Halapa and the Shoy Colotter. Clinch of Oreg for Canerst a humming, Marston MacRicket. Clinch of a feet board at the shine, the people a crujoch a humming, Yoy MacRimen. A barst a humming, Moolish Campbell. It barst a scrivig, it was high tall caharish. The clachki exhermin and carlic, if it could have machna line in your presenting, it could fame it shine silum. Vasho a hewn scrocanet the lord in Achka, clinch of show for shillivish a hacket there ecolotted. Welcome to Culloden Battlefield from the National Trust for Scotland on this, the 275th anniversary of the Battle of Culloden. On this day, 275 years ago, the last rising of the Jacobites was brutally crushed and Highland culture changed forever. At the National Trust for Scotland, we feel privileged to be looking after the battlefield and we want to thank you for joining us today to help commemorate the Fallen.
The story of Culloden is universal. It is a story of war, violence, and the communities that emerged from it. These combine to create a sense of place that you can really sense here on the battlefield. And we are actively working to preserve it. The threat to Culloden Battlefield is from inappropriate housing development. Now, you can see over my shoulder here the View Hill development. This is 16 five-bedroomed executive modern homes of a style that's completely inappropriate to this landscape setting. At one stage in the last two years, we felt surrounded by planning applications. There were six applications on every single side of the battlefield. And if we're not careful, we'll end up like, like Central Park, where we're surrounded by inappropriate housing developments. What, what these do is actually they disrupt the sense of place. So by putting something which is so out of keeping in a line of sight, people lose the emotional response that they have to this landscape. And it makes it incredibly difficult then for them to experience history in a meaningful way that's so important to them. It's one of the biggest challenges for us in the National Trust for Scotland to resource the battle against these types of developments because every application could have five or six turns and twists to it as they appeal and they tweak a development and we have to try and keep on top of what's being talked about, how important the piece of land on which the development proposal is, is, is on, how much archaeology do we know about that piece of land, what was the historical part that it played in the battle. All this takes time and we have to do the right thing by people. A big challenge we have is to define inappropriate development. This is partly what was behind the Culloden 300 initiative. As a conservation charity, we have a firm idea of what we think development, or appropriate development might look like and what inappropriate development might look like. But we're not the sole arbiters of taste with Culloden. It's a national asset. It's an international asset. So really we want everybody else to help decide what type of development and what type of landscape Culloden should look like going into the future. Our first step was to actually engage our local communities and ask people, why does Culloden matter? It's okay for us to say it, we know why it matters, but we need to know from everybody else, is it that significant? If there's only a handful of people that really care, then we're wasting our time. Our first step was to do a big survey of all the visitors that came to the site and also all our local communities. We then engaged with academics and other key stakeholders. We held a series of town hall events, which were in local community halls and um, community spaces. That enabled us to get different layers of response from people. Initially, that sense of, wow, of course it matters. Now, 75% of our respondents gave us a massive clear response that yes, it matters. Yes, it's important. These were UK respondents. 21% of the respondents were international. They came back and said it's vitally important. In the community hall events, we were able to tease out more about what appropriate development might look like and what inappropriate development definitely wouldn't be suitable. There we put wireframes up in front of people and we had a more in-depth discussion about what was acceptable visually and what wasn't. The responses that we got though have given us the mandate to really advocate seriously now and to try to work a lot more collaboratively with our local stakeholders to improve the planning system and improve, improve the processes for dealing with planning applications. This is the Culloden 300 report here which you can download from the website. Our starting point was to survey 3,000 people. 2,900 re responded to the online survey and 100 people were surveyed in physical meetings pre-COVID where we could actually analyse people's responses and talk a bit more in depth about how they felt about Culloden. Of the responses, 75% were from the wider UK area, 21% were international. The survey was open for a year for the Culloden 300 initiative and we then spent about a month going through all the responses and coding the responses looking for strong key messages from all the different respondents to the survey. And what came through loud and clear were, were three main threads. One was on the sense of place, this slightly intangible way of describing a place and its importance. It's a combination of the cultural significance of the historical event of the battle itself and the physical landscape. In combination, the three together are greater than the sum of their parts. And that's what we mean by sense of place. The other main threads which the respondents told us about were memorialization and remembrance. Memorialization is about actually commemorating the event that took place. 
Remembrance, as we know every year at Armistice, is about actually remembering the fallen and the tragic events that took place here. The third thread which people told us about loud and clear was in the impact of the events that took place here, so the historical significance both locally, nationally and internationally. After Culloden, Highland culture changed. The Scots diaspora really took flight and there are people who come back now to visit who may have had threads which go back hundreds of years which started off when the Highlanders were chased off Culloden Moor and then went to the Four Winds. The next steps for, the, for us now, as the National Trust for Scotland, uh, are to try to get a collaborative group together to improve the planning system, produce much stronger and more meaningful guidance to planners, to look into the possibilities of, of acquiring land around Culloden so we can actually protect it for forever, for everybody, uh, also to look at long-term conservation agreements. Can we work in partnership with local people and local landowners to protect the site? Can we also try and measure sense of place? We talk about its intangible qualities, but most things can be measured. So if we can come up with a physical peer-reviewed way to, to, to evaluate sense of place, we can use it to protect the site from inappropriate development. We can also look at strengthening designations. So UNESCO World Heritage Site status for Culloden could make an important difference to us. It will certainly raise the profile with planners and with other authorities. And of course the biggest and the most important challenge for us is to make sure that there are, there are no further inappropriate developments like View Hill that we have here. Because quite honestly, it's a travesty that as a country we're not protecting this national asset better than we are. We must act now. We've already seen an increase in planning applications across the moor, which is why we've created Culloden's Fighting Fund. We need your help. A gift to the fund will provide us with the resources to fight insensitive developments and lets us work collaboratively with local and national stakeholders to protect the cultural significance of Culloden Moor. You can donate today at nts.org.uk donate. Or you can text Culloden, that's C-U-L-L-O-D-E-N, to 70970 to donate £5. Donate £5 by texting Culloden, C-U-L-L-O-D-E-N, to 70970. Fundraising payments and donations will be processed and administered by the National Funding Scheme, charity number 1149800, operating as donate. Texts will be charged at your standard network rate. For terms and conditions, see www.easydonate.org. Thank you. That's absolutely, um, well, it's, it's great to have everyone back. We're gonna start again very shortly. So I'm going to give you a moment to get your cups of tea, come back, get yourself settled down, um, and then we'll start again. And we'll have the fantastic opportunity to talk with um, Raul Curtis Mason, uh, our Karen Buchanan and um, Mark Gibson and we're going to explore sense of place. So I'll just give you a moment and we'll start back at uh, 118. Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, I found this morning really interesting and quite challenging as well. Um, it's always interesting to find out what 
sort of historians and archaeologists think about the battlefield. And we're going to take a slightly different turn uh, this morning or this afternoon, sorry. Um, we're going to talk about the nebulous concept of sense of place. Incredibly important, particularly when we're thinking about uh, the battlefield, but also there are many, many other sites uh, within Scotland where sense of place plays a real part in uh, their story. And I'm very excited to have with us a couple of different folks here today who have all engaged with the concept of sense of place. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Mark Gibson. Um, Mark Gibson, I, has been uh, involved. He, well, he's the rescuer and owner of the magical Craig Nagillan estate in Ayrshire. Um, despite being a recognized beauty, um, he had to fight to protect it and let it lead to a rebirth of the former East Ayrshire coal field, which it neighbors. Mark is a zoology graduate and a chartered surveyor and was also a founding trustee of Dunfries House and the Scottish Dark Sky Observatory. And Mark is going to spend 15 minutes or so chatting to us about fighting for our landscapes. Then we're gonna move on to Dr. Karen Buchanan, who I'll introduce in her own time um, from Gerloch and Raoul Curtis Mason, who um, you have met already. So with that in mind, Mark, I'll hand over to you. Is Mark there? experience. Yes, Mark, can you hear me all right? Me. I think maybe... Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Go ahead. Sure. You, you can hear. Good. Um, <clears throat> so I'll um, illustrate um, what I have to say. Um, through our experience at Craig and Gillen Estate. Um, you can see a picture of it on the screen. Um, it's a magical place. Um, it's set within the southern uplands of Scotland, um, about 14 miles from the sea, and right in the middle of what was the East Ayrshire coalfield. Um, it actually neighbours um, the village of Dum Ellington, which was a coal mining community um, up until the 1970s. And you couldn't really find a much greater contrast um, than the untouched um, Sleeping Beauty, which was Craig and Gillen when I came, and the village which had really had its heart torn um, by mass unemployment and all the social evils that go with that which followed the closure of the deep mines in the 1970s. Um, the landscape is recognised as a designed landscape um, by Historic Scotland, as was, um, and um, rated amongst the top four um, in the whole of um, Scotland. Um, they assess designed landscapes against seven different criteria, and they rated it outstanding in all seven categories. Um, the landscape is very much a combination of um, that created by man. Um, so the planting, the category A listed buildings, which you can see in the center of the picture and the work of, um, the work of God really um, in the formation of the, the hills and the natural environment. Um, when I came, when I came to Craig and Gillen 21 years ago, um, it was um, in a pretty sad state. Um, it had been neglected, and really nothing had been done for almost exactly 100 years. Um, it was also a bit scary because of the wild reputation of Dam Ellington, um, and so it was. At the time, it felt a brave move, but I'm very glad that I made it. Um, we embarked um, on 
<clears throat> the um, restoration of the landscape and the buildings and the woodlands and all the other elements of the landscape. And I was hugely um, emboldened and encouraged by the very warm support um, from the community, um, all ages. Um, we um, were very much involved with the <clears throat> um, primary schools, the two primary schools, uh, with Dune Academy, the secondary schools, and with um, all age groups really throughout the community and everybody in incredibly <clears throat> um, and unexpectedly to me um, because they've been um, very much kept out of the place before um, terrific warm support um, as time went by um, we developed a, a plan for the future and that was very much just through informal discussion um, not a formal consultation, and we developed together a, a plan of how Craig and Gillen might be able to contribute to a new future for the Dune Valley um, and a way out of um, the hard times. Um, and that future we saw um, based on outdoor activities and <clears throat> um, nature and cultural tourism, and the future was the, the whole foundation of that future was the landscape and history of Craig and Gillen. And we had support uh, very much, not just from the community, um, but from um, our local authority, East Ayrshire Council. Um, it's a, a marvellous landscape and it had huge potential to create that new future. In, a similar way really to Dumfries House and what it could do for Cumnock and the surrounding areas. Um, and the work progressed, it was a terrific adventure, um, but along came a threat um, in the form at that time of um, proposals to build gigantic turbines, um, wind turbines, which would have totally dominated um, that beautiful landscape and threatened the future that we'd um, that, that, we, that, that we planned. We were up against big forces, um, but we knew we had to try. And in order to d defend that landscape, um, the first thing to do was to research what had made it. Um, as I said, a combination of man, nature, and God, um, to understand it physically as well, what had made it, um, its relation to man, its sense of place. Um, the more you um, get to know it and the more you find out about what made it, um, the stronger you love it. And you come to love it with a passion and that love and that passion is what gives you energy and determination, and you really need both of those to stand a chance at all. You then need to identify possible stakeholders, and those are will include the local authority, um, both the planners and the local councillors, um, obviously the local community council, um, Historic Scotland or HES now, um, Mountaineering Council, John Muir Trust, um, indirect stakeholders, so not directly connected with the landscape, but dependent on it, um, like the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and with all of those stakeholders to make them aware of the threat and why it's a threat, and try to galvanize them into action. It's the, the Stakes are very much um, up against you. Um, you have to fight mainly in planning terms and certainly any objection letters have to be for planning reasons. And most people don't have experience of um, planning law. So the first thing we did was to arrange a public meeting, find out what people thought. Um, if they didn't like the, the plans or were um, frightened by them, um, it was to put those fears into planning terms, 
create a letter um, based on all of that, which people could sign. Um, we formed a small group. It's crucial to have a small group, otherwise it becomes unwieldy, to have as few meetings as possible and basically action, not meetings. Um, that was very much the case with Dumfries House. I think we had a total amount of about 25 minutes of meetings. Um, and it, but that way we were able to, or the, the whole community was able to participate in the planning process. It meant going out often on dark, cold winter evenings um, around every house in every village which might have been affected by the proposals. And in total, um, we achieved, I think, the highest number of objections that East Asia Council had ever received for developments. Um, over 20,000. Um, a common reaction um, on the doorstep was, well, this is all very well, but mm -hmm. if um, the government wants to do something, it will do it regardless. And at that time, I thought, no, that's not the case. Um, they will listen um, to people. Um, in amongst the, all the hard work, there were moments of humour, uh, we, we had quite a few um, young people joined in um, helping. And I remember, I think the first night, it was a gloomy, cold night. And um, one young lad of about 14 came out of a house where he'd um, been asking if people would like to sign and um, came out face like thunder. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, they wouldn't sign. And I said, that's fine. Everybody is entitled to their own opinion. To which his reply was, only if it's the right one, um, which is a good attitude. Um, if you can find um, people from outside um, who are well known, um, <clears throat> that to lend, lend their names, that's always a help as well, because um, uh, a sports legend or a film star is going to have a bigger political um, influence than, than necessarily somebody from the local community. Um, at the very first application, um, Historic Scotland um, said that the proposal um, would have a very damaging impact on the landscape and its category A listed buildings and that that negative impact could not be overstated. They went on to say that no mitigation was possible. However, following a change of government, the applicant resubmitted with a few relatively minor changes. Historic Scotland said they were now pleased to withdraw their objection. Extraordinary. And it turned out that a very senior minister had verbally advised Historic Scotland to make this change um, chilling. S South Ayrshire Council, um, uh, um, um, with, within whose boundaries the application stood, um, under pressure changed their objection to no objection. East Ayrshire Council, however, which was um, our um, local authority, which is, sorry, our local authority, um, is within um, 100 yards or so of the proposed development and stood to um, suffer much more than South Ash Council. They strongly objected. Um, however, Scottish ministers decided to approve the application um, without going to a public inquiry. East Ayrshire Council sought a judicial review, um, but again under pressure um, and bearing in mind um, slim budgets and the risk to um, scarce resources um, at the very last moment decided that they couldn't um, proceed with the ju judicial review which they um, had embarked upon. I therefore agreed with East Ayrshire Council to take over their position at the Judicial Review. Um, again, a scary task, but it had to be done. 
to do this, um, I had to employ um, a solicitor and the solicitor's junior. The solicitor in turn had to instruct a senior QC and a junior QC. Um, an enormous expense um, and the legal process is quite disillusioning. I hadn't been through it before. Um, you would begin with preparing a, a detailed statement of case um, with the solicitor and with the QC. Um, it's an extraordinary system where you can't speak direct to the QC. You have to deal direct with the um, either the senior or the junior solicitor who then talks to the QC. Um, not ideal for communication. Um, <clears throat> the judge was then appointed, and this is commonplace, was appointed 10 minutes before the case began, so had no opportunity to read any of the um, statement of case. Um, one aspect of that case was that the designed landscape had been designated and initially just half of Craig and Gillen, um, and then as its importance was recognized, um, Historic Scotland um, designated the balance of a further 1500 acres. The judge um, misunderstood this. Um, and although Historic Scotland had said that one of the great values of the place was that the landscape was unfragmented um, and had never been sold off in part, um, the judge misunderstood this and said, oh, but that's incorrect because um, the applicant um, purchased a further 1,500 acres. Uh, we hadn't done any of the kind. It was just the designation had been um, increased in extent. Because you're not allowed to say anything in court, we couldn't challenge this. So the judge made the wrong decision, turned down our application for protected costs. Um, and there was nothing we could do. So we had to appeal that decision. Um, again, several ten, tens of thousands of pounds at stake. Um, and we won that appeal. And so we had achieved the position of protected costs. Um, however, it, it had been a, a grueling experience. Um, we'd already put at risk um, nearly 100,000 pounds. Um, there would have been another five steps to go go through um, in the courts. Um, even if we had won at every stage, and there's no means of telling in law whether you're going to or not, um, the final stage would have been um, a public inquiry. Even if the reporter, um, and I agree completely with um, Professor Duffy about reporters, um, even if he had found in our favour, it's not, his findings are not legally binding and Scottish ministers could have gone against them. And we decided therefore that rather than imperil the whole place, we would withdraw um, if the applicant would um, reimburse some of our costs. Um, which was eventually agreed to. So really a very bleak experience. Um, and the lessons are, um, first of all, that, um, that, that bodies like Historic Environment Scotland, as they now are, the Forest Commission or Scottish Forestry as they are now, um, Nature Scott, they must be given proper full independence and be allowed to make assessments on applications without fear. Politicians must then openly weigh the advice they receive from those organisations against any other considerations there may be and not hide them, um, hide behind those um, organizations as they did in our case. Really important to um, for everybody to get involved in the um, development of the national planning framework, um, which I see is something which um, NTS is um, advocating here. I 
completely agree with that. You must have, um, to stand a chance, you must have 100% passion and determination and a total belief in what's right. Um, with, with the experience that we've had, you might think, well, if we'd known all of that in advance, um, there was no point in trying. But you have to try. You have to know that you have tried. Um, designations and lines on maps uh, and purchase of land is all very well and good um, in themselves. But um, development outside those boundaries can have an effect as well. So there's um, a limit to that. Um, the possibility of UNESCO um, designation in the case of Culloden is a good one, but again, doesn't guarantee anything as has been seen at New Lanark. Um, I think that's really um, all I have to say. I think it's, um, we tried, we tried very hard, we've learned, we have stopped some of the more serious um, proposals that were being made, and I think we've deterred others from trying. Um, and I wish anybody involved um, the very best of luck. It's a hard battle, but it's one worth fighting. Um, and a last thing, think hard before voting on the 9th of May. Um, thank you very much indeed. Sorry if I've gone on too long. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was really interesting and quite heartrending in terms of the challenges that clearly you had to face um, and push through. I think what I find particularly interesting, and this is where our next speaker is going to um, touch on, uh, Dr. Karen Buchanan. Karen has recently been involved um, in the refurbishment of Gerlock Museum, and she has, um, with support with the people of Gerlock, really created a place that represents um, the community of Gerlock, something that is um, as by and for Gerlock and, and resonates with sense of place um, for the whole of the community. And um, she has been working at Gerlock since 2013. And her new heritage attraction, well, it's not her heritage attraction, the community's new heritage attraction has regenerated a key site in Gerlock and was also winner of the Art Fund Museum of the Year in um, 2020. So I'm going to let her sort of touch on the importance of community, community engagement, and the representation of community. Thank you, Katie, and, and thanks <clears throat> thanks very much for those kind words about the museum as well. Um, as Katie said, we in, at, at Gerlof Museum, we realised a major cultural heritage project for the area in, in 2019, so the complete redevelopment of the museum. And the background will be familiar to, to many, so I'll just in a nutshell touch on it. Our previous home was an increasingly decrepit farmsteading, um, where the lease was running out and with core funding slashed and very limited opportunities for revenue generation, we needed a new home and a new business model in order to save the museum and survive, which we managed. Um, the new Gerlock Museum consists of five galleries over two floors. It tells the story of Gerlock and the surrounding area from its earliest geology through to the modern day. And within it, we have doubled our gallery space. We have commercial space for retail and a cafe with, I think, one of the finest views in the area over Loch Gearloch to the Isle of Skye. So this involved several years of hard work, not least of which was raising the 2.4 million pounds that we needed before the project could go ahead. And I've been asked to talk about how we harnessed community engagement and sense of place to realize that project in just 15 minutes. So the title on the slide is the title that we use for the project, Our Land, Our People, Our, our Story. And we had to choose a um, title for our funders, which is quite a hard thing to do, distilling this massive project down into just a few words. 
And we settled on our land, our people, our story. It's, it's simple. There are no clever puns in there, but I think it's the essence of what our project was about. And it also highlights three salient features of our sense of place as well. So it emphasizes that human connection, attachment to place, the idea of place as a focus of meaning that not only enabled us to achieve our project, but also I think comes across very strongly in our displays and events and activities. And I just want to say a bit about the ways in which I think Sense of Place has been so evident in that Gerloch Museum project. We are a geographically defined museum. So we collect within the boundary of the old Gerloch parish. And um, you might use this new fashionable marketing term of hyper-local to describe us. So although we constantly aspire to expand our audiences locally and, and globally, we are optimized for a geographically defined area in terms of the heritage that we're focused on. So you could argue that we do have a very clearly defined sense of place as far as our collections and our heritage is concerned. And perhaps that is part of the appeal to those who share that sense of place. And we're first and foremost a, a community museum so the museum has always been strongly supported by the community. It was founded by volunteers. It's still managed by a board of volunteers and just about everything we do only succeeds because of the extensive volunteer effort that goes into it. And this was something that was always at the forefront of our thinking uh, throughout the project. Um, so when I talk about the community, um, as well as those directly involved in the museum as volunteers, we have people who live and work in Gerloch and the surrounding area, but also those who visit and for whom cultural tourism is an important contributor to sense of place. And of course, our diaspora who may never have managed to visit, but whose culture and identity and notion of belonging are very much tied into our sense of place. And this relates to back to what Professor Mary Pitchock was saying this morning about harnessing support from international audiences from the point of view of Culloden as well. So the project was about saving our heritage for the future. And heritage, of course, supports sense of place by creating that continuity over time, protecting the objects in the museum. The stories also our vernacular language, the, the, our Gallic cultural heritage that, that defines our place. Um, so there was a strong depth of feeling, I would say, within the community that museum could not be allowed to close and a dogged determination that we could ensure its survival. And we were fortunate that supporters got caught up in this campaign to save the museum. And of course, what better way to foster both community engagement and sense of place than through a campaign like that. But it wasn't just good luck that maintained that momentum. Uh, we were in constant communication and consultation with the community. Um, our story, was always that this is something for the community, for the whole community. It is community driven and it requires input and effort from the wider community to succeed. So for example, before we started approaching outside funders, we asked the community to pledge money towards the cost of the new building. And we used this investment both to get the community involved from the start but also to show funders the extent of community support that existed and, and to give them an idea that we had the capacity to, to see this through. Um, throughout the course of the project, we ultimately raised 200,000 of our 2.4 million just from our own local fundraising efforts. And that's in an area of less than 2,000 inhabitants. So the number of people involved in organizing, but also in attending this fundraising events, just snowballed throughout the several years of the project. And we managed to suck in people who hadn't been involved in the museum before, um, people who turned up to pub quizzes for the beer, and two years later find themselves volunteering behind the museum desk when we opened. Um, 
and I think the 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 just the, the constant communication that we had with the community was was very important in that we wrote every two weeks in the local paper about what was happening, what the next stage was, what we'd achieved since the last time. And when there was important news to impart, we literally dropped letters uh, through every door uh, letterbox in, in the parish um, to, to, to let people know why they were important to these uh, developments. And when we finally raised our fundraising target, there was enormous excitement uh, within the community. So in thinking about our displays then, we also relied on the community to tell us what themes were important to them, what aspects of our heritage and our sense of place should the greatest focus be placed on. We then went back to them, we showed them our proposals, we asked for feedback. We had exhibitions both in the museum and in other villages in the, in the parish, in the area, um, uh, from which we got strategic feedback on what we were proposing to do. So we put a great deal of effort into assuring people could have their say in how we were interpreting their heritage. And there were two senses of place, interestingly, at work there, because the old museum in its Kuthi um, farmsteading was enormously popular and there was actually an element of doubt even among those who loved the museum about whether we could pull off moving this collection into a building that was so different and still keep the feel of the old museum, still retain that sense of place. Ultimately, the new uh, building, the bunker, gener has generated a lot of interest and has actually become a large part of the interest and, and the story itself. So our displays were very much co-curated, volunteers were involved, they roped in others to help them, they recorded interviews, they made films. People came out of the woodwork with donations that were so good, we had to change our display plan several times. And on a practical level, people pulled heather, thatched a croft house for us, made a model of our bunker that would have cost us a fortune to commission. And a local art teacher even gave kids batik lessons. They all went off and chose a museum object, recreated it in batik, and these uh, now decorate what would otherwise have been a very austere concrete activity room at the back of the building. They're wonderful. And we decanted our collection entirely with museum, uh, sorry, with, with volunteer effort, roping in the strongest members of the community and those with the biggest vans. So ultimately a very large and diverse section of the community contributed to uh, creating the new Gerlach Museum. And I just want to say a little bit about the feedback we've had uh, just in finishing off about our new museum. So in a review of Gerlach Museum for the Museum's Journal, Katie described the museum as in the community, about the community and for the community. And, and I would add to that, that it's also by the community. So there's a genuine stake in what we had created from beginning to end. And the Museum of the Year judges described our story as a tale of people power determination and local pride. They said that the, uh, the redisplay of the museum's collection encapsulated the history, culture, beauty and character of Gerloch. So they got that sense of place too. And they described the new Gerloch Museum as having reanimated the village's pride in its heritage and produced a sustainable cultural landmark for, for generations of visitors to enjoy. So that is, of course, a wonderful affirmation of precisely what we set out to do. And it really felt like the whole community had won the award and not just Gerald Museum. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. That was really interesting. And I think sort of brings together some of the, the, the pieces of the puzzle here. So we've got this, this landscape, this incredible landscape that Mark was discussing that was under threat, that required immense amounts of effort um, in order to protect portions of. And Karen, of course, you're reflecting on the intense amount of effort and engagement um, necessary to work with communities to build a sense of place within 
within four walls and reflecting the, the wider community of Gerlach. I'm hoping that Raoul um, will pull these two strands together. Um, he's going to give us a talk now about Culloden 300 and how we have to live with the battlefield because this is a living landscape, guys. Um, mm. But uh, Raoul is the operations manager for Culloden Battlefield. He has a strong heritage and communications experience. He was a national trust um, in England, senior strategic advisor, and the landscape historian with Historic Environment Scotland. He's a journalist, a publisher, an author, and he represented the UK government as commissioner general for the Antalya Expo in 2016. So, to you, Raoul. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, if I could just get the first slide up, please. Um, what I'm going to do is to switch off my video so you can focus on that. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to be talking about uh, the Culloden 300 initiative. Uh, this aims to create a vision for the battlefield and its surrounding cultural landscape. A vision that we all create and we all sign up to. Government, local communities, Highland Council, National Trusts, Historic Environment Scotland, businesses, battlefield trusts, developers, the whole lot of us. Because as we've found out, over the course of the day, unless we all put our shoulders together, it ain't going to happen. The title came out of a comment that the Highland Council senior planners uh, made to me when I just started. Uh, I was going around for one of those familiarisation meetings with them, and uh, they just automatically launched straight into a scathing statement. So you're always saying no to everything all the time, and it's ruining your credibility. And it caught me completely unawares, and I went away and thought, well, OK, um, maybe. Maybe there's a point, but fundamentally, we're a conservation charity. We're charged with conserving Culloden, so what do you expect? And most of the time, we're dead right, because the development just isn't appropriate, and much of what's been already allowed has done untold damage to the fragile treasured landscape of Culloden. But maybe the council had a fair point. Uh, maybe that just saying no to everything and not offering up an alternative is not particularly helpful to planners. So. Sarah and our communications team said that, why don't we start actually talking about what we would like to see rather than just what we wouldn't? And then it was Dermot Ferns and our head of policy who suggested that we pick the next big anniversary, which would be the 300th, and we come up with what we would like to see, a vision for the landscape. That sounds like a long time away, 300, but this is the 275th, and 2046 is only 25 years from now. So uh, if any of you have kids, you know how quickly that can go. Um, we were still talking amongst ourselves about how we would plan this and what steps we'd take and, and how we could get the right stakeholder heads and knock them together. And assuming that, of course, the site was hugely important. And it was actually Katie who stepped in and said, well, have we actually asked the people if Culloden matters? And we looked at it and we thought, well, we must have done that. And we just all assumed that, that this had been done and there must be screeds of, of responses. And, Actually, no, there weren't. there have been a little bit, but not a lot. And this actually matters a great deal because essentially, if people don't care for the asset, then we've got no mandate to make a big song and dance about it. And we can't be using our members' money to try and protect the site and conserve it. So we thought we'd better go and find out. So early 2019, we launched a three-phase consultation exercise. Um, one, the first bit was a deceptively simple online survey, which had almost 3,000 respondents. If you can change the slide, please. Um, this simple survey, the first part, actually just said, does Culloden matter? Um, if so, why? And please wax lyrical about what, 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 why it does make a big difference to you. Um, this was aimed to give us some quantitative data, um, some numbers for how important the site was and which factors really matter to people. Um, and it was also give us the context for, for the whole initiative and shape the other discussions with our other constituent groups. Uh, the second part of the consultation was to engage our local communities in a more in-depth way to explore the notion of appropriate and inappropriate development. And these terms are thrown around, but they can be quite tricky to define, particularly in landscape terms. Um, we commissioned landscape architects to create view shed, no, sorry, uh, zones of theoretical visibility analyses, which would show which areas on and around the battlefield were in prime view from the widest, most visible areas. Um, we also 
asked the landscape architects to come up with wireframe illustrations from key points on the battlefield looking in the same directions. And these would illustrate what different scales of buildings and developments might look like. This was to prompt people to consider what might or might not be acceptable in terms of appropriate development. Uh, in the picture, you can see the wireframes put against the easels. And we had comment boxes where people could anonymously write what they thought and how they felt. And we basically took it on the road then. We, we did one, well, we did, I think three sessions in the visitor center at Culloden, but we also went out into the community. We went into, we held afternoon and evening events in the community halls and, and church halls, in Smithton, the Loch, Croy, Culloden. And I want to offer a huge thank you to our volunteers for helping, especially Peter Cow. The hours we spent stood in cold, drafty halls, explaining patiently what these views meant, why it was significant. And actually the response was worth it. Um, the time we spent was worth it. Uh, the third phase of the consultation was to hold targeted, in-depth, anonymous conversations with key stakeholders. So this was when we would go to the planners, the councillors, folks who wouldn't really be able to publicly declare what their opinion might be. But we gave them the space and the freedom to talk anonymously. So we could just find out and gauge, not adding any names to it, of course, but just to give us that um, a measure of what the desire was to protect the site. And at best, we could conserve the cultural landscape. When we first looked at uh, the response, we were blown away by, firstly, where the, where the people came from. Um, if you look towards the bottom, you can see the, the graph there. Well, 67% were from Scotland, 33% from the wider UK and rest of the world. So we've clearly got a site of national and international significance. Uh, next slide, please. And why did they respond in a simple, strong way? Um, yes, Culloden matters, absolutely unequivocally. And why? Well, broadly four headings, history, remembrance, memorialization, and opinions on development. Now there's much more underlying these headings as there is underlying the, the headline stats that I'm gonna talk about today, but, and it's really worth reading the full report, which you can find on the website. There's a summary and a full version. And we go into a lot more detail about the different types of responses and the numbers of people who gave them. 62% of all those surveyed said that history of the site was the most important factor. 39% expressed strong opinions on development. And these ranged from none whatsoever, please, is nothing sacred, to, well, maybe okay, but please only small scale rural agricultural style developments, please. They've got to fit with this landscape. The image on the right there, you can see uh, that's from the 2019 anniversary of the battle. Um, well, our anniversary event, we always hold the event on the Saturday closest to the 16th of April. Uh, but I love this picture because it's just ordinarily without pandemics and massive health scares, it's a phenomenal event. And you have people from all over the world coming, you get all the clan flags, the clan retinues, the pipers, the clan chiefs come. It's just a phenomenal day. Um, lots of dressing up, lots of conversation, lots of serious commemoration. Um, and it's just such a privilege to see how important such a site is to people. Please come next year and the years after that. We're hoping the crowds will come back. Uh, next slide, please. To the nub, really, um, the development opinions were the critical part. And this is where sense of place comes to the fore. Um, much talk about this term sense of place. Um, at Culloden, we consider it to be really where the historical events, the cultural significance and the physical landscape interact and resonate with us in a deep and meaningful way. Now, the million dollar question here is how we can all work together better to conserve this sense of place. Nobody denied its existence or suggested that it didn't matter. In fact, just the opposite. This is exactly what excites people about the battlefield. Um, personally, I've worked on hundreds of historic sites across Scotland and the whole of the UK. And I've never known such a site which generates such a strong emotional and spiritual response in people. I see visitors regularly come off the battlefield in tears once they absorb the facts and the tragic story of what happened. Their thoughts and feelings have the chance to range across the open 
wide landscape. Basically, this landscape gives them space to breathe. Next slide, please. What else matters? Well, these illustrations just show some of the other things. The fact that we have a rare jewel, a relatively intact battlefield, just and only just. It is already compromised, we can't deny that. View hills have a massive impact on it already. Other housing developments haven't helped. But relatively little surrounding development is exceptionally rare in a site of this age. Very, very few battlefields of this age survive in such an intact way. Are we the ones who are going to let that go? Is it going to happen on our watch? What the people told us um, in terms of the important factors at Culloden, nature and landscape was big, war graves, preserving for the future, the importance of telling the story for future generations, the national significance, the importance of showing respect, the peacefulness of the place, the atmosphere, ancestry and genealogy, genealogy uh, remembering the fallen. Tourism was a major thing, an impact on the environment. Um, in a busy normal season, we employ more than 75 people. And the fact it's a memorial. And all these factors came out wide and clear. Next slide, please. But the biggest by far is the wide open spaces that we've got. How does it come together? And why are there such strong responses? It's because these wide open spaces let the imagination and the soul breathe. Having absor absorbed the blow by blow account of the Jacobite slaughter, and we don't pull our punches in the visitor center, the immersion theater film still makes the hairs on the back of our neck stand up. Once they've absorbed that and they've absorbed the confusing mix of who exactly was in the British army and the, and the Jacobite ranks, how the fact that there was a mixture of potential civil war rather than just a religious or a Scotland versus England tussle, having absorbed and reflected on the global power struggle behind the battle and the battle for global domination soon after, the military occupation of Scotland, the acceleration of the clearances, the attempted eradication of Highland culture, the Scots diaspora, it's a huge, huge story. You need a big canvas and a big landscape to let your mind wander once you've read about and understood all this. And it is this unique landscape over which this battle was fought upon and it's this unique landscape which holds the memories and enables us and future generations to understand. It may be a complex beast to get hold of and almost a mystical phrase, but sense of place, when you boil it down, how we protect and preserve it, it's actually quite a simple prospect. We just have to keep this relatively unspoiled and intact cultural landscape just as it is. We carry on our job of curating it to conserve it as it would have looked back in 1746. No more intrusive, inappropriate developments to break up the wide open spaces, and no more intrusions that ruin the cultural significance or the historic events. Simple. So why can't we just do it? Next slide, please. Because as we've heard, landscapes are subtle things, they're tricky. Stick a line around them and designate them significant, and you automatically say that what's not around that line or what's out with that line may not have any significance at all. And that's patent nonsense for a landscape that might rely on bigger views and borrowed features. It may work for buildings, monuments, and simple, simple parts of archaeology. But no, not landscapes. The views of a landscape stretch way beyond lines on a map. So what are we going to do? The Culloden 300, um, the report, Living with the Battlefield, is just the start. We're going to work hard on creating a vision. We're going to knock the right heads together. We're going to try to get people to work. It's, it's heartbreaking really when we looked at what the various stakeholders are doing. I mean, the Highland Council wants to protect Culloden Battlefield. Its conservation area statement's great. Historic Environment Scotland really wants to protect the battlefield. Its battlefield's inventory research and, and designation is great. The government, everybody, all of us wants to protect it, but we're not working together properly. The designations aren't working properly. The attitudes aren't working properly. We need to be better at it. We also need to measure sense of place. Everything else can be measured these days and if we can measure it and put a number on it, it can get into planning speak and it gives us stronger arguments. We need to explore land acquisition. We've talked about that before. We need to explore long-term conservation agreements. You bet, that's simple. <laughs> well, 
it'll take time, but we'll get there. We need to create better guidance. Let's build the skills that we need to protect Culloden's cultural landscape, but also our other fine landscapes. It isn't just down to the history, it's also down to landscape impact assessments. It requires subtle, highly developed skills to protect landscapes. And of course, we need to work together better, all of us, not just NTS and the government and the council and the other agencies. We've got to stop hideous developments like View Hill getting through. Designations need strengthening, that's a no brainer. They've got to be made statutory and they need to be resourced. One thing I learned in my time with what was then Historic Scotland, and I know Craig and Gillen intimately, um, it was a, an eye opener to me in that I was functioning over the whole of Scotland. And really, for designations to work, you need boots on the ground, you need skilled and experienced boots on the ground to be able to walk these landscapes and not just look at them from a desktop in an office. Because sometimes developments do stretch the truth. As we see at View Hill, they said it was going to be over the ridge and they put the, the, the houses over on different contour lines. Unless you physically visit sites and appreciate how the views are impacted, you can't really give a proper opinion. And of course, our agencies need teeth to do it by. So will we do it all by 2046? Well, not necessarily. And here's the rub. It's not up to us. Yes, we're leading it. We're happy to lead it, but it's up to you. We can't do it without you for a start. And it's not something that somebody else is gonna pick up and do for us. I think maybe that's where these developments have been falling through the cracks. Oh, it's somebody else that makes that decision. But we've got to make more noise. We've got to work together more. We will lead the charge. We will fight the fight. We will do all those other glorious cliches, but we need the funding. We need the resources to do this. At the NTS, we don't receive a, a penny in government support for this work, so we do need your help. You'll see more details about how you can donate to the Fighting Fund um, and Conserve Culloden's Fund in the States. And we thank you for all the help you've given us so far. Huge amount of, of debt, as I say, to the volunteers, also to Professor Duffy. Chris, your funding for this, we wouldn't have got anywhere near as far as we have without your help and support. So I would like to say a uh, huge thank you to everybody so far and please help us continue the fight. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. I think what is really interesting is where we start bringing agencies, landscapes and communities together. Because if we don't have that community involvement and that community buy-in, then we are we are incredibly challenged. We, we're not going to, to see any kind of significant impact because it's the communities that are affected by the development that either want it or don't want it. And it's their power, the power of the collective voice that can make impact, um, be it to other agencies, to politicians, to key decision makers. Um, what I'm going to do now is um, I thought maybe we could have a bit of a discussion around sense of place. Um, and I know that, Mark, I think you you stuck your hand up at one point, I saw. So um, we'll, we'll come back to you. And, and there's definitely already a question in the question chat. If anybody has any questions, please pop it in the chat or in the Q&A, and I'll try to get to it um, the best I can. But I thought maybe we would start with um, the concept of sense of place. And we've been throwing this word about um, for the whole of the session. And I wonder if we could have a moment and talk about the conditions necessary to create sense of place. Because we've got two very different examples of three very different examples of sense of place. Um, so really, how does sense of place happen? And I might start with you, you Mark, if you don't mind. How do you think sense of place happens? Uh, Mark, I think you're muted. Can you unmute? Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It, it, um, <clears throat> and it's something which doesn't affect everybody. Um, you have to be susceptible to that sense of place. Um, and it's something which is indefinably in the atmosphere. Um, and I think it's probably something to do with the, the history of the place, with the shape of the land, with the with what's happened there in history. 
um, it's really how you personally react to that landscape. And that reaction, I think, will be different um, with different people. But although a lot of people will recognize, and it definitely applies to the battlefield at Culloden, um, it, it very definitely has a very strong atmosphere and a very strong sense of place. Um, and they can be good, they can be bad, or they can just be very powerful. And in that case, I think it's just a very powerful one. I haven't really answered your question, but um, it's difficult to define. But it no, does. That, that's absolutely fair enough. Karen, what, what do you think? I largely agree with Mark. I think um, perhaps one word he didn't use was, was emotion. So I, th I think sense of place comes from emotion. And sometimes that emotion is based on experience. Um, sometimes perhaps it's not direct experience but it is um as mark said it, it is a very personal thing for me and it, it it is different for for different individuals so it's hard to say that a place has a sense of place in the sense that that sense of place is different for different individuals but definitely emo emotional, yeah. Raoul, would you like to feed in? Yeah, sure, I uh, completely agree. I also would add in probably spiritual and psychological feelings too, and, 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 and physical responses to sight. Um, some people actually feel a, 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 a physical response. I think it might be possible to try to, 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 to measure it, I'm always an optimist at heart, um, but there's quite a lot of things. If you think about our responses, the, the marketeers in life and the PR of people are pretty good at tracking our responses to things. And they're pretty good at knowing how to manipulate our desires and how we can be closer to making that, that purchase in the end. And I think there's maybe tools that we can borrow from different disciplines that might be able to be used. Because um, we know at, at, at Culloden, we've got these sort of building blocks of the historical significance, the cultural significance, and the physical landscape. We can measure all of those separately, but if we can also measure people's sort of graded response to them, we might get somewhere with it. Um, I think that it, there'd be no harm in doing more work on it, um, but except in the point that every site's different. There's some interesting work around museum objects, which I think can link quite nicely to the concept of sense of place in terms of that everybody makes their own meaning when they engage with an object. And it is very much about the history of the object, but also the emotional state of the person who encounters that object and their own personal histories. And because you don't actually know what's going on inside of somebody's head. Um, and and it, I think, your point there about taking a quite a cross-disciplinary approach to exploring the concept of sense of place is, is something that actually has a lot of legs in it. And I think, I think that sort of leads on to my next question. So if we're struggling to define sense of place, how, how do we then say, well, that will impact on sense of place? How do we know that a wind farm or a housing development or a poor choice in terms of curatorial decision making is going to impact on sense of place. Karen, would you be able to start with that? And then we'll, well go to the museum. Like, what you said about museum objects, they are, of course, as you say, curated, they are interpreted. <clears throat> and I suppose that makes me think about the, the difference between sense of place for, uh, I'm gonna use the word insiders and outsiders, just because it helps me explain what, what I mean. But so those who who are sort of inside the place, who, who have shared, whether it's language, for example, the Gaelic language, Gaelic cultural heritage in, in, in relation to Gerloch, um, but their sense of place is based on something shared. Uh, whereas for outsiders, it's based on something else. And that something else 
um, I would maybe relate to this interpretation. It, it's the way that we want people to see things or the only information that they have on which to base their sense of place. So in, in defining sense of place, I think, for example, for, for those two groups, that would be um, something very, very different. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. It does make sense because we're talking really about people who who have a shared language when it comes to a particular location or a particular object or a particular particular cultural event. And that shared language can it, it effectively creates community of interest, doesn't it? So we have a community of interest around a thing or a place. And because of either shared experiences or um, ideas about experiences or pieces of information that they have, they're able to react in a specific way. But if people don't have that specific language around engaging with that object or that place or that building, they may have different ways in. So Mark, sorry, I'll, I'll, I've, I've gone off there a bit, but Mark, I'll, I'll come back to you in terms of, you know, how, what sort of things impact sense of play. Um, again, quite difficult to answer, um, but I think you could have, if you have a place with a strong sense of place, um, and it might be a building, um, and it might be um, somewhere more natural, like um, the battlefield, um, you can have an extension of what's there, whether it's an extra part of a building, and it won't necessarily destroy the sense of place that existed before. Um, but if you have something which is very different, so if you had within um, a natural landscape or even a man-made landscape, if you had something, a new development, um, which um, was much huger in terms of scale, like a gigantic wind turbine, um, or a nuclear power station or a multi-story block of flats um, that could destroy that sense of place. Um, it's something which is out of scale or out of character. You can have an extension of what's there, um, which wouldn't necessarily take it away, um, but you've got to be very, very careful and very sensitive. Raul? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd also add that when I did the landscape impact assessment training, that anything and everything will have an impact on a landscape. The judgment comes in in deciding if that impact is acceptable or appropriate, or it has a negative impact, in which case you wouldn't allow it. I think with Culloden, we have the battlefield itself, as we found out this morning, it's bigger than we thought. And, but if we know that, that landscape was actually fought over and part of the battlefield, well, it's a no-brainer, just no, there shouldn't be any development whatsoever because it would kill and shatter, not only a sense of place, but it would desecrate the graveyard, basically. Um, it's the other areas. There was bigger views out with the landscape where it gets trickier. And I think when Mark mentioned the inventory of gardens and design landscapes, the original one back in 1987 actually marked on key views from all the landscapes and made an attempt to say no development should be considered in key views up to mountains or key views over to lochs or key, key views that the landscape itself borrowed. And we have, this, we have that issue absolutely at Culloden. When you're on the roof garden looking out down to the Firth and you're looking out beyond, even beyond where the battle was fought over, the feelings that you get really help, under, you, help you understand the, the, the story. So we have to now look at where are the key areas that need protecting the most and somehow prioritise it. Yeah, it, it becomes really it becomes really challenging when you sort of when you when you try to put numbers on things. And, and I completely hear what you're saying in terms of, of, of finding a way of measuring it. And, 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 and I guess I would reiterate also grounding it within our community, because it is the community that is living in our landscape. Um, it's that they are the people who are going to be going to the shops in our landscape. They are the people who are going to be working in our landscape, either working for the center or not working for the center. I mean, the, the, you know, the, this we are part of our community, and we have to make sure that whatever we do in terms of exploring sense of place, um, protecting sense of place, thinking about impact on sense of place, we we ground it in 
their voice as well. Um, I guess that also brings me on to, I mean, I know I've, I've created, I've asked some pretty slippery questions, guys. Um, and I'm going to ask another slippery question, which you may or may not be able to, to answer. But is it, is it possible to protect sense of place, Mark? Um, well, yes, by, by saying no to everything. Um, yes, of course you can. And I think it's really important that in some cases we do do that. Um, we don't just um, survive on bread alone. It's um, we our spirits need feeding and nurturing just as much as uh, our bodies. So I think we should we we should look after them, and um, we um, we should be certainly um, ready to protect them. Um, it's really important to um, to the quality of life. Karen, what do you think? Well, I think that if, if I turn that around, you've asked how, how do we protect sense of place? Maybe we need to think about how do we use sense of place to protect the place? Um, you know, I, I, in, in terms of strategically moving forward, I think that's really important. And that's obviously everything from encouraging environmental stewardship to the um, cultural um, dimension that, that, that Raoul mentioned earlier. Um, I think we can protect sense of place. I think I, I think it is it risks being less than objective at times um, because if you are protecting a sense of place, you almost have to select what that sense of place is that you are protecting. Um, you know, it's a hard. bit like, sorry? Which is hard because as we said earlier, that will um, reach people in different ways. Yes. Uh, it's difficult to know which you protect. Perhaps you can enhance it by hanging all the developers on the site. <laughs> That's a bit ruthless. <laughs> but it, it almost reminds me of you know, appraising an archive collection. You know, what, what you keep and what you throw out and um, how dare you make the decision. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I, think, I think that's right. I think you can build on it as well. And I think what um, I think Professor Pittock said this morning, if people don't know about it and don't appreciate it or don't understand something, I think he was talking in the historical value context, then they may not value it. So we have to actually explain to our communities too why this sense of place is important, why 300,000 people want to come and visit and want to come and enjoy a site and respond to it. Because often when you live in a place, it can become quite, quite commonplace. You're driving around the same views, what's the big deal? Um, you can take things for granted. And I think there's also responsibility on us to, to bring everybody on board and to, to help people appreciate that if we did value the sense of place and we all did our bit to protect that sense of place, we all benefit, not just economically, we all benefit, as Mark suggests, we benefit from our spirits being nurtured and our quality of life. It's one thing COVID's taught us all during the lockdowns, crikey, just the chance to get outside into green space and breathe again is phenomenally valuable. And it's been taken away, but sadly, maybe it's only when things get taken away that we really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think I think um, Murray's earlier point about taking our heritage for granted, um, and I think you could extend that to sort of taking our landscapes and our cultural heritage for granted. Um, there's some really amazing stuff in Scotland. There's amazing stories in, in small communities um, across mountains and big houses. And, and there's something about making it accessible, grounding it in the community and making sure that people understand that it is for them and not in a thou shalt have way, but in a let's work together way uh, that maybe there's something in that around sense of place. And, and I, I think this conversation has been really, really interesting. And, and, and thank you so much to everyone for contributing. We do have one question uh, from sort of the, the wider panel, and this is directed towards you, Raul. 
Um, it's specifically around young people. Um, so do you think raising awareness in schools and universities would help youth could be a very powerful tool. So Raul, if you could maybe touch on that and then if either of the other two panelists want to speak from their own perspective about the engaging um, young people within their either collections or um, landscapes, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Young people, I mean, crikey, our education program at Culloden is, is, is huge, um, as you well know. And the value is phenomenal. Um, if we're not educating the next generations, then we're sunk, we're, well, we're just not doing our jobs, we might as well go home, and we certainly shouldn't be paid. Um, I believe that it's the next generations who are actually going to protect and keep things going. And it, again, it comes back to the sense of value. If they learn to value these, these places and they learn to value how to look after them, it'll happen. If we don't, and if we stop talking about it, and if we stop fighting these threats, and I really appreciate what Mark was saying, Yes, it, it is flipping exhausting. I know exactly how tiring it is. You, but you need to keep going. If you don't, you don't give the next people the opportunity to carry the flag and, and take it to the next stage. We're only just custodians. I know it's a term that gets thrown around a lot very lightly, but I do believe it and I do take it as a very serious responsibility. Um, it's the next generation though, that's got to take it on. And it's just as important that we teach them as we do it from the existing. Mark, what do you think? I completely agree with Raul. Um, <clears throat> and just a little thing from our own experience um, and with something which um, somebody else said um, recently, which is that you can very easily take your landscape or your heritage for granted, or indeed your sense of place. Uh, it's something which you absorb and you just take as part of life. Um, but one thing which struck me when I first came to Craig and Gillen um, and doing a lot of work with um, young kids from um, particularly the primary schools was how, um, how many of them didn't appreciate um, their landscape. And if you asked them what they wanted to do in life, they'd say, move away from Dumellington. And I thought that was really sad. Um, and one thing which we did um, very early on, I got to know the um, head of the art department and we organized that for two days of the year, his pupils would come to Craig and Gillen and they could paint or draw anything which inspired them. Um, whether that was a tree or a shepherd or a sheep or a building whatever, what, anything which inspired them. And some of the results were incredibly powerful. Um, the beauty of painting or drawing is that instead of just passing a landscape or a building, passing it by, you've really, really got to concentrate on it as you're drawing it. And in concentrating on it, you see its beauty. Um, and that's something which I think then stay, stays with them um, for a long time or forever and makes them want to look after it. So I completely agree. Um, thank you. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just that, you know, talking about sense of place and that emotional connection to place and how it's based on experiences and routinely you know, I hear of people visiting the museum with their kids because they used to come when they were kids and they remember one or two things, that's all, but it's stuck in their memory and so they come back and, and every time they come back, they, they renew their sense of place, but they also develop it. Um, so I don't get too hung up on um, trying to teach, you know, vast quantities or, or um, making children learn lots about things at a time. I, I think they learn when they want to learn. But so long as that emotional connection is there, they will keep coming back and, and, and they will learn uh, for the rest of their lives. They'll learn about the place. Just as much about depth of engagement, really, isn't it? Um, as it is about sort of quantity of engagement. Um, I have another question from Duncan Alexander. Um, I'm going to amend it slightly. 
he says, how has landscape become important to many people during, la or landscape has become important to many people during lockdown? And can we capitalize on that? And I'm gonna add sort of landscape and community because I feel like community has become increasingly important over the course of, of lockdown. Um, and Raul, if we start with you and then maybe come to you, Karen, and, and, and then Mark. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> I think it's been very, very, very important, and we do have a great opportunity to capitalise on it. I also want to just touch on something else I've just spotted, and it's been coming up on and off um, today, the comments about Outlander. Um, from what we're saying about sense of place and educating the next generations and the importance of green space, there are so many different ways of coming to heritage sites and so many different vehicles for getting an understanding of, of their significance if that's through works of fiction, if it's through movies, if it's through anything, it's great that people are actually getting access. And that again is part of, I guess what we're trying to do is open up that access. So specifically in terms of um, landscapes and lockdowns, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first thing we did was open the gates to the car park again, to let people just come and park and get out to the big eye open spaces. I think we can start to offer more from the countryside we can start to try and hold people's hands a bit more and, and, and engage them rather than just open the gates and say look run around in the mountains knock yourselves out there is a bit of a job to do to actually explain what it's about why things are being conserved the way they are why a million trees on this hillside is going to have a huge environmental benefit to us in, in 100 years time so yes absolutely and i think funnily enough we're just embarking on a, on a a new 10 year corporate strategy in the trust. And that's come up as a, as a key potential theme going forward, exactly how we capitalize on it. So good question. Um, Karen? Yeah, something we're very much doing at the minute. So we're spending some of the prize money we got from the Art Fund Museum of the Year to develop an area at the rear and in front of the museum. Um, to explain our, our physical landscape to visitors. And at the back of the museum, we've developed an archeological trail. Uh, we have roundhouses on the hill behind, and we tell that story in the museum, but we want people to go and see that landscape themselves as well. It's a really fascinating multi-period landscape. At the front of the museum is slightly less ambitious. It's really nothing more than a picnic area with a nice view, but we're putting in some interpretation panels about the geology so people can understand the geology of the area that the landscape they're looking at, and also about the history of the fishing traditions in the area. So they just get that taste of the cultural heritage while they are appreciating the natural beauty of the landscape as well. Excellent. And Mark, what, what, how would you reflect on that comment about people during lockdowns? Um, I don't know. I think um, obviously mankind has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years um, in amongst an outdoor landscape. Um, we may have become a little bit urbanized in the last hundred years, but, but most of us um, still have a strong part of our psyche rooted in the outdoors. And I think to be suddenly denied it um, in the past year um, has um, woken, awakened that um, realization that um, we and natural world need each other. And there's a great, a great want for it. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with you. I think there is something around COVID to me has made us think around corners and it's made us think about the things that are close to home. And that can be a landscape, that can be a story, and that can be our communities or our neighbors or our street. And let's be honest, it's been a traumatic time. Um, we as a society have really been through something which, you know, okay, let's say maybe for, you know, we wouldn't have expected. And I think that there's something good that can come out of the other end of it. If we can use the passion and determination and the focus on community that all of you were touching on. And if we can use that to protect and care for our landscapes, our sense of place, our community heritage, 
that that's going to be a good thing. I'm going to finish up today. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for taking the time to speak to us. It's been a beautiful day outside and many of you have been inside sitting in front of your computers on a Saturday. So we really appreciate you um, spending the time with us. Now I'm finishing early so that those who wish can um, go to the virtual uh, Prince Philip's funeral. And um, I best wishes to everyone, no matter where you are connecting to us from. And we hope that we can speak in person soon. Um, so take care and all the best. Thank you.